Oh, Desh is also here. Hi, Desh. Hey, Desh. Hey, Tanya, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Desh, hi, how are you? Hi. Okay, we are live now. Good evening, everyone from Ortho TV. And I hand it over to the moderator for further proceedings. Hi there. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chaitanya Mudgal, and uh, I'm the chairman of the Indo-US Hand Surgery Conference. This is our fourth year. Uh, we hold it on an annual basis. Uh, this is session two of five, which is going to be held every Saturday in May at the same time, 8 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Our theme for this year, which uh, we can't do in person and we're doing it virtually, is common conditions in upper limb surgery, how I do it. Today's session, which will be expertly moderated by Anil Bhatt from Manipal, uh, deals with common uh, nerve compressions and tendinopathies. And he's got a superb faculty list uh, with uh, Dr. Thate from uh, Bombay, Binu Thomas from CMC, Marco Rizzo from uh, Mayo Clinic, and Christine Novak from Toronto Sick Kids. We would not be here without our sponsors, and uh, we would not be here without Ortho TV. So to our sponsors and Ortho TV, I say a huge thank you. In particular, I'd like to introduce one of our sponsors today, uh, Jayashri and Desh Deshpande from the Deshpande Foundation, who have done such fantastic work in Hubli, Karnataka. Four years ago when we started this, we didn't have anyone supporting or believing us. But Desh Pandey Foundation, Jayashri and Desh really stepped up and shepherded this process and really believed in us. So thank you. For those of you who are watching, and if you have to ask questions, and we'd love you to ask questions, you have to scroll down uh, on the link below Ortho TV, and you'll see a Slido link. Please use that to ask as many questions as you can. Before we get the program started, I'd like to ask uh, Desh and Jayashri, to say a few words. Guys? Good evening. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, all of you for dealing with the present crisis in the world. And uh, thanks for uh, choosing to be a doctor. My um, father, my sister, and uh, many others uh, in our family uh, chose to uh, become doctors. And I have a huge respect for your commitment and the sacrifices that you make. Um, I'm also uh, pleased that we live in a connected world and uh, experts like uh, uh, Dr. Chaitanya Mudgal and others um, uh, can uh, share their experience. And uh, I'm sure um, all of you will add much needed value to this knowledge to contextualize it for India. And um, uh, it's so nice to see that the dream of Chaitanya just a few years ago has mushroomed into a large initiative. Um, and I wish you all the best. Uh, um, and uh, uh, have a very productive uh, workshop. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chaitanya. You know, I think uh, just a few years ago, uh, you, you had this dream and, and you've always been passionate about sharing whatever you know with the rest of the world after the successful program you had in China. I know you had a passion, so much passion that nobody could stop you anyway. Unstoppable. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm so pleased that People from Hubli, uh, Dr. Sachin, Ravankar, Ashok Kalamdani, all these people stepped up to really give you a hand to make it all happen. And, and now I see experts from all over the world kicking in and, and helping out and really, really appreciate. I really appreciate what you're doing. And I'm sure it'll, it'll mean a lot to uh, all the people in India. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we really, really appreciate your support and we'd love you to hang on and stay and watch the proceedings for the next couple of hours if you so choose. But if you have other things to do with your family on this Saturday, we understand. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Anil Bhatt, the Chief of Hand Surgery at uh, KMC Manipal. Anil, all yours, buddy. Thank you, Chaitanya. Uh, it's my privilege that uh, I've been associated with this uh, Indo-US hand surgery conference right from the inception four years back uh, with Chaitanya when we did the program at Hubli. And uh, last year we did this in Manipal and, and it, was, it was a really good time. And then as I see Marco and uh, you know Chaitanya and all of them, uh, the nostalgia comes back. Uh, anyways, uh, starting off the program itself, uh, one of the most fascinating uh, things in upper limb and hand surgery is compressive neuropathy. I think we still don't have answers for a lot of these, even though carpal tunnel is kind of bread and butter for a hand surgeon. Uh, still controversies exist. And then there's another dimension, which is the lateral epicondylitis. 
I think two different uh, scenarios here. Uh, we would love to hear from our expert faculty and I have a good bunch of them. And to start off with uh, the first talk itself, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, the diagnosis and open release by none other than Dr. Mukund Takte, who is who's considered to be one of the biggest authorities in India. Uh, Dr. Takte, please. Thank you very much for giving me the privilege to present carpal tunnel syndrome in this Indo-US CME. The subtopic given to me is diagnosis and open surgical management. In the 10 minutes that I have been given, I will try to do justice to this topic as far as possible. Once again, I thank the Indo-US CME organizers for this collaboration between India and the United States. I bring you greetings from Bombay Hospital in Mumbai. Carpal tunnel syndrome is the commonest entrapment or compressive neuropathy which involves the compression of the median nerve in the carpal tunnel. If we discuss the etiology of carpal tunnel syndrome, the one common thing between all of them is anything that alters the balance between the volume of the tunnel and volume of the contents will eventually cause a carpal tunnel syndrome. As examples, I have listed a few things here and the reasons. Distal radius fracture, change in the volume actually because of the movement of the radius. Rheumatoid synovitis, tendon volume goes up. Hypothyroidism and pregnancy, fluid accumulation. Repetitive strain syndrome has been implicated, but it is highly disputed in many, many studies. However, workers using vibratory tools are very much affected by carpal tunnel syndrome. And I actually was witness to this study during a visiting fellowship in Indianapolis in the US. Where no specific cause exists, it is called primary carpal tunnel syndrome. And to our great surprise, this is the commonest variety of carpal tunnel syndrome. Very rarely do we find the secondary causes listed in the earlier slide. This demographic is typically women in the age group of 30 to 50. If we look at the physiology of what actually happens to the nerve, it starts with a compression leading to a venous backflow and then a swelling, followed by altered conduction, breach of blood nerve barrier, increase of connective tissue and protein deposition, followed by myelin loss, arterial ischemia when the pressure becomes too much, and finally loss of conduction. The important signs and symptoms are numbness and tingling in the median nerve distribution, Nocturnal numbness, tingling and sleep disturbance, in my opinion, is one of the most important pathognomonic signs of carpal tunnel syndrome. Weakness and or atrophy of the thinner musculature. Tinnitus sign positive over the median nerve. Phalanx test positive within 60 seconds. And a loss of two-point discrimination. As a disclosure, we always do electrophysiology. For confirmation of diagnosis, documenting the extent of the injury and for medical legal purpose. This is the clinical examination. First is to elicit <coughs> the palmaris longus with the two finger method or any other method you like. Then to elicit the tinnel sign medial to the palmaris longus. Also to test the sensation in the median territory. So this is the line which divides the ulnar territory on this side ulnar half of the ring and the little finger, and the median territory on this side. Phalanx test is done by flexing the wrist or hyperflexing it and holding in that position for about 60 seconds. And if the tingling numbness or the altered sensation appears in the affected or both hands, that test is considered positive. We also always elicit abduction like so. And we have to resist it. If there is any wasting, it can be seen at this point. That was Tinel's sign. Also look for trophic changes in the carpal tunnel territory. That is the half of ring finger up to the thumb. And if you notice here, both the thumb and the index finger are showing trophic changes in the skin. Carpal tunnel syndrome at the end of the day requires a release, whatever method you use to release it. And I have discussed here the possible methods. The oldest is the extended carpal tunnel release with a large skin incision spanning the palm and the forearm. 
the minimal access open technique which is what we use now and the endoscopic technique this is the extended carpal release the one mistake in this marking is this zig should have come on the ulnar side otherwise you can damage the palmar cutaneous branch step 1 expose the palmar aponeurosis complete the exposure of the palmar aponeurosis once that is cut you start seeing the roof of the carpal tunnel and here you can see roof of the carpal tunnel in continuity with the deep fascia of the forearm and the structures within you can also see the motor branch and one must always look and demonstrate the motor branch just like the calot strangle is demonstrated in gall bladder if required a synovectomy can be done it is rarely required but with this approach it is very easy to do it now we come to the minimal access technique this square that i have drawn shows you what actually the incision is in the minimal access open release which is this one over here on the right so we start by marking the radial aspect of the fourth ray and in that radial aspect we mark the incision 1.5 to 2 cm stopping well short of the distal wrist crease we cut the dermis and the fat first after cutting that the superficial palmar aponeurosis is exposed we make a plane between the aponeurosis and subcutaneous tissue both proximally as well as distally we then cut the superficial palmar aponeurosis and we'll see for the first time what is called distal hold fast fibers this term was discussed by dr david elliot from sx these fibers cover the thinner aponeurosis and form an additional layer before the roof of the carpal tunnel we put a retractor proximally exposing the distal forearm and cut the continuation of the palmar aponeurosis proximally as well as distally we then expose the thinner muscles by cutting the distal hold fast fibers over here the distal hold fast fibers are cleared distally and we create a plane proximal in the forearm and distal in the hand so that now the roof of the carpal tunnel can be exposed in its full extent once we put appropriate retractors distal hold fast fibers have been completely cleared and now we are opening the roof of the carpal tunnel with a number 15 blade the tunnel has been opened you can see the contents the complete tunnel is opened in the palm we then put a retractor and view the distal forearm fascia as it is seen over here and the final junction of the tunnel with that fascia so this is the junction of the final fibers of the tunnel and that is the fascia we cut the junction and advance in the distal forearm this is a view showing the carpal tunnel and the distal forearm fascia in continuity completely released we then do the same distally and palmar arch being visualized signifies the completion of the release so proximally you should cut the distal forearm fascia and distally you should keep cutting the fibrous tissue on top till you can see the palmar arch which is very clearly seen over here if you retract the median nerve then you see the flexor tendons the tip is if you can see the tendon through the synovium it doesn't require a synovectomy we always look for and note the motor branch this black arrow shows the motor branch over here closure is done with vicryl rapid so there is no question of suture removal a dressing is given with fluff gauze and a pop slab which maintains the wrist in 10 degrees of extension mp joints are kept free for complete mobilization of the hand conclude by saying minimal access open release is as good as endoscopic release in my opinion the risk of complications is far lower if you need to do a synovectomy a separate transverse wrist incision is possible it reduces the morbidity compared to crossing the wrist in exceptional circumstances i do a camets of procedure simultaneously i personally do not prefer primary opponents plasty 
in my experience the thinner muscles recover and interestingly patients often are unaware of their loss of opposition and they compensate quite often with other muscles i want to thank you all for a patient hearing and specifically professor anil bhat and dr chaitanya mudgal for organizing this indo us cme thank you very much thank you sir thank you so much for that lucid talk uh, as usual uh, any questions uh, from the audience dr warrior no no questions as yet anil you can carry on with the discussions uh, i have uh, two questions uh, come directly to me uh, so one is what is the current recommendation or the level of evidence for minimally invasive carpal tunnel uh, release so it in my opinion with minimally invasive carpal tunnel release like the one i do i think the size of the incision and the exposure is totally complete in terms of distal forearm and uh, distally in the palm and i personally feel that the complication rate is far lower than in endoscopic and has a much lower learning curve compared to endoscopic but if you ask me to quote papers about the level of evidence i can't okay thank you sir uh, other thing was uh, what is the role of uh, neurolysis in your hands in any idiopathic carpal tunnel syndrome do you ever do it or are there any particular indications yeah so at the beginning of my career about 25 years ago i used to think that i am a very savvy microsurgeon and would do neurolysis i have subsequently realized i probably did more harm than good because at the end of the day neurolysis means you are fiddling around with the axon bundles in the nerve and what good are you doing with that is a very good question so currently the only time i do a anything to the nerve if if i see that the epineurium has petechial hemorrhages is fibrosed and i feel it is compressing the nerve in which case all i do is take a number 15 new blade and i take a incision on the epineurium and let it split open i do not do internal neurolysis because i personally believe it does more harm than good any questions from the rest of the faculty could i yeah. uh, just uh, mukund you did uh, talk about carpal tunnel in distal radius fractures mm -hmm. so i just like to know from either chaitanya or marco about their experience of having this uh, condition where post a distal radius fracture it unmasks or makes a uh, existing carpal tunnel more severe and are there any repercussions of that marco what do you think let's see what uh, the mayo experience is absolutely i think that's a very good point so here i you know um and these can be quite problematic leading to complex regional pain syndrome if neglected and and uh, dystrophies of sorts that can be very very difficult to untangle so having a heightened awareness of a waking a sleeping giant if you will when you have a distal radius fracture i think is critical and uh, dr jupiter taught us from um, mass general to be very cognizant of those uh, of those possibilities and and lean on the aggressive side of treating carpal tunnel at the time of uh, distal radius, or uh, if they happen to have symptoms shortly after surgery, then moving forward with a carpal tunnel release uh, in an expedient manner um, will save you a lot of trouble down the line. Try. Yeah, I agree. About 20 years ago, I, when I started doing carpal tunnels, very, very commonly with distal radius fractures, I, got, I took a lot of heat for it. Um, for obvious reasons. Um, but my thinking was that it is it is so little to do for such a lot of gain and saves you so much trouble after. So my indications include most patients, especially women over the age of 60, all high energy injuries and all multifocal injuries at the level of the radius, carpus and metacarpals, which is a large number of patients, but I've never regretted doing it. But I've had to take back other people's patients when they came back with acute carpal tunnel syndrome when I was on call. So I've used that as a negative feedback loop to reinforce my own thoughts. But again, I'm biased and I'll accept that. So. I do oh. have a question for uh, uh, Christine. Uh, I know you, you'll probably get this question after for uh, cubital tunnel as well. 
But where do you see the ner uh, role of nerve gliding in patients who come to you, say, with uh, carpal tunnel syndrome of pregnancy or they're 35 and the electrical studies are normal? So I, I think preoperatively, a lot of those patients, they should, um, they should all be assessed for uh, neural tightness. And it's not just in the level of the uh, carpal tunnel or if you're talking cubital tunnel, but the, the whole extremity. I mean, there's a portion of the nerve that's made out of uh, connective tissue. And so connective tissue, uh, like connective tissue anywhere can get tight or can get stuck. And so I think the idea of nerve gliding both pre-op and post-op is really important. So would you, let's say you had a woman who's say, um, you know, seven months pregnant and, you know, obviously she's not an ideal candidate for surgery. Would splinting and nerve gliding be something that you would educate her on? For sure. Cause I think there's, there's no downside to it. Um, and I think that, I mean, the, you know, the risk benefit component of it is, is minimal. And so night splinting, um, for sure, just to buy time and, and, and the nerve gliding. And I think that, um, in patients who have, um, a specific, whether it's pregnancy or specific action that they're doing that, um, is precipitating their carpal tunnel symptoms, then, um, seeing them through that period of time can maybe um, offset the need for a carpal tunnel release later. Right. Thank you. Hey, Mukund, I forgot to ask yeah. you one thing. In the Indian yeah. context, how often do you guys feel the need to use, say, vitamin B6 when you have negative electrodiagnostic studies or when the patient is unwilling for surgery? Do you see any role for use of it? I haven't used it. And I'm fortunate to have an extraordinarily good electrophysiology lab in my hospital. So they do some very, very sensitive tests. So usually they don't, uh, they don't miss it. But what I do like to sometimes do if patient is not willing or not suitable is call a MSK ultrasound colleague and try to put uh, Depomedrol in the carpal tunnel mm -hmm. under image guidance. And that has given good results. Uh, okay, so has there been a trend towards using ultrasound as a diagnostic tool in India? If EDX is negative? Some units do, particularly Professor Bhatt. Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. not particularly, I'm not particularly fond of ultrasound over electrophysiology because I think electrophysiology gives me objective values of CMAP, SNAP, and all the other things. And the sensitive tests between the split ring finger, etc. But I'll yeah. let Dr. Bhatt answer that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've been you've been using it for a long time now. It started off with uh, you know measurements of the nerve in the, the for a normative study and things like that. But now I'm basically an endoscopic carpal tunnel man in the sense that all my carpal tunnels primarily go for endoscopic carpal tunnel release, and an ultrasound examination is very valuable for me to uh, you know go ahead with the decision of endoscopic carpal tunnel. So we've seen a lot of times some aberrant arteries and you know anomalous structures and things like that. So it always helps me in that. Even otherwise, uh, we've been doing ultrasound for uh, hand conditions from very long carpal tunnel decurrence. Uh, you know, it, it started off with uh, research projects and things like that. So we, we found it quite useful in many situations. And now we are going towards, the, uh, as Christine was telling, we are also documenting nerve gliding uh, parameters in carpal tunnel, especially post-distal radius fixations, uh, wherever there are CRPS, and also even a routine idiopathic carpal tunnel. So we are also starting to document the nerve gliding, <laughs> taking some landmarks, and uh, you know, it's going towards that way now. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting because in, I use ultrasound a lot. And we follow John Fowler's uh, data and guidance and guidelines. And uh, we use the ratio between the forearm and the carpal tunnel. And if it's more than 1.5 or a yeah. standard value of more than 11 millimeters square for yeah. uh, pistonotic dilatation, then we use that as a diagnostic tool if EDX is negative. Yeah. If, uh, so we use that as a second layer of evidence. So you're using, sorry, you're using that as a more sensitive test than electrodiagnosis. Yes. And wow. it, it's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. I have, I have, I have drunk the Kool-Aid. I'm sorry to say that. But, but you need to have someone who's that good with yes. your sonology because it's a, a interpreter based or dependent in yes. investigation. Yeah. So we yeah. have a neuromuscular ultrasound division whose job is to image uh, nerves with a neuromuscular ultrasound. And they give us wonderful data. So we, I find it very reliable.
I've never regretted it so far. You have okay, any, one last question to the. Ah, Ashwath, yeah. You have come across any case where uh, patient is symptomatic and the NCV is uh, negative? Typical features. You're asking or, me. For that matter, even ultrasound. Sometimes uh, you do the ultrasound; it comes out negative. Uh, but patient yeah, is. Yeah. Yes, sir. For you. This is for me. Yeah, yes. no, I think uh, if the patient is very, very properly symptomatic, they usually catch it in the electrophysiology. But there are some patients who are diabetics who have peripheral neuropathy and who often have radiculopathy, and they present with symptoms which we as clinicians start thinking like carpal tunnel. And in fact, electrophysiology helps us to differentiate those from the carpal tunnel and avoid unnecessary surgery because. catching a radiculitis is very very important okay. especially 50 plus people with diabetes any role for uh, uh, question as like uh, the boston boston, questionnaire. boston couple yeah so we did a study in our unit and one of my post graduates did a thesis on it during which time we were using it we are too lazy to continue the use right now because the thesis is over I, I think Binu has a publication on that problem. Yeah, <laughs> we have done an Indian uh, version of the Boston Carpal Tunnel Questionnaire, which was published a uh, few years back. But if you want to ask me one thing, that is pathognomonic is nocturnal disturbance, sleep disturbance, waking up with tingling numbness. Right, right. So one last question to the panel. Uh, The role of immobilization post-op. How do you all do it? Uh, so I do it for forty-eight hours and then give a splint which is removable. Doctor Warrior. Yeah, um, a little more than forty-eight hours. I give a plaster slab for in the functional position or the safe position for four days. So when I do my first check dress, I see whether the patient is comfortable moving the wrist. and of course the range of movements are complete in the fingers and if they don't have too much discomfort then they come out of that and a splint uh, if they need it but otherwise just a small dressing but it's Blue. based on patient comfort we give it uh, for more than that we give it for uh, almost 10 days till suture removal but the therapist will take it and uh, mobilize the wrist and then ask the patient to take keep it back so Chaitanya. we are more careful about uh, exposing the wounds And you want everyone to be confused, I think. <laughs> no, I, I, it's a very interesting aspect. I always find it fascinating. Chaitanya, one of the I things that I would say is, um, as many people put um, take the dressing off, minimal dressing, take it off a couple of days after surgery, and start the patient on range of motion. But we actually recommend patients wear their the splint that they wore before surgery at night. because until the patient has a fairly good wrist range of motion they're going to wake up with a lot of discomfort at night not get a good night's sleep or else wake up with a lot of inflammation swelling and pain in the morning and so for a couple of weeks until they get better range of motion um just wear the pre op um splint at night i can vouch for that i have just had a carpal tunnel release the <laughs> <laughs> app was taken down in 48 hours and for 10 days it was nice to have the splint at night yeah. like dr novax is yeah. and by about day 14 i gave up the splint so uh, that's the final proof for this question then thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much uh, i have a question for dr sethe oh uh, yes. you said you do not prefer doing uh, an opponent's plasty in the first sitting yeah. but uh, do you decide after seeing how much the motor losses and what the patient's requirement is like no. you said right now that you went through a carpal tunnel but if you were the one who had severe motor loss would you prefer doing it on yourself yeah, so the... you know we had to cut that part of the talk because it was exceeding 10 minutes but the current paper that we use is a japanese paper which says that if the motor latency of the second lumbrical exceeds 8 milliseconds then the chance of recovery of the thinar eminence is likely to be poor and then we do a primary opponents plasty if it is not exceeding 8 milliseconds on the second lumbrical then we are almost sure it's going to recover but uh, what i mean is the peri period of recovery could be prolonged for some i mean for patient suppose a surgeon yeah, who needs so their hand as an yeah so i'll give so, you an example 
if we get a patient with an absent snap that is sensory nerve action potential and a wasted thena reminens i typically see a return to thena reminens function between 3 and 6 months there's a, anil there's a quick question i know we are running a little short of time but there's a quick question and i think it's important is it possible to mention regarding the importance of the distal old past fibers that is sir sorry i didn't understand the question so what is the importance of the distal yeah, the old past importance is if you do not recognize this layer then you will not cleanly expose the roof of the carpal tunnel what you think you are cutting will be the distal old fast fibers so unless you cleanly release this layer you will not get a continuum of the roof of the carpal tunnel with the distal forearm fascia which is what you need to cut finally and there's uh, last one about the vitreal rapid have you seen yeah. any infection or wound gaping no never and Fine. we Anil. from from day 3 we make them wash their hands four times a day with a moisturizing soap brave man but anil you can take on <laughs> thank you sir thank you so much sir uh, we'll move on to the next talk i will leave now thank you sir permission, i'll leave the meeting i'm sorry about this no no mukund go to what you have to do thank you thanks very much man i'll talk to you after so we are having short i guess of time so we'll move on to the next talk uh, by binu which is is kibite talent greetings from velour i am talking on cubital tunnel syndrome and tardy ulnar nerve palsy today both of these are ulnar nerve dysfunction at the level of the elbow with cubital tunnel syndrome due to a combination of compression traction and friction while tardy ulnar nerve palsy develops many years after a trauma to the elbow with cubitus valgus deformity resulting from a chronic stretch of the nerve these are not uncommon conditions in our outpatient the anatomy of the cubital tunnel the, the description varies from author to author i will uh, discuss what uh, gelberman has written he said the cubital tunnel retinaculum covers the ulnar nerve and can be divided into three parts the uh, first part is the entrance of the tunnel formed by the ulnar groove behind the medial epicondyle and the second part consists of the arcuate fascia also called the osborn's ligament from the medial epicondyle to the auricular nerve and this connects the ulnar and humeral origins of the flexor carpi ulnaris and the third part of the cubital tunnel is the area of the ulnar nerve overlying the over the muscle bellies of the flexor carpi ulnaris under actually the medial intermuscular strep septum as well as a structure called the arcade of strathers which is a thickening in the fa fascia between the triceps and medial intermuscular septum are also um, seen to have some compressive effect on the ulnar nerve and this also needs to be released in the management the elbow flexion beyond 90 degrees can produce um, a stretch of the nerve to about 15% and uh, intraneural pressure increases sharply the shape of the tunnel also changes from ovoid to elliptical when acutely flexed and this is the the cause of the cubital tunnel syndrome a number of anatomical and mechanical causes have been uh, attributed to the production of cubital tunnel syndrome but in india never forget that leprosy with thickening of the ulnar nerve at the level of the elbow is probably the most common cause of ulnar nerve dysfunction and should be excluded uh, in the diagnosis this is a classic uh, patient with a cubital valgus deformity who develops ulnar nerve dysfunction and as you can see why the ulnar nerve is getting stretched on this x-ray and uh, we generally tend to see the valgus angle which you can see here is more than 20 degrees paresthesia and numbness in the ulnar nerve territory is the hallmark of uh, both these situations with a dull ache at the medial aspect of the elbow in later stages clawing and intrinsic wasting are seen the classical elbow deformity can be valgus deformity can be seen in tardy ulnar nerve palsy also 
A number of provocative tests uh, helps in the diagnosis, such as tunnel sign when you tap over the ulnar nerve, and uh, the elbow flexion compression test where compression of the nerve at the elbow with the elbow inflection produces the classical symptoms. You also must test whether the ulnar nerve is subluxing on flexing and extending the joint. The other classic tests for ulnar nerve palsy, the Froman sign and the Wartenberg sign are also positive in later stages. Clinical examination is the gold standard for diagnosis and not any other investigations. The other interesting test is a scratch collapse test, which you can see my colleagues demonstrating. This is scratching the medial aspect of the elbow inhibits active external rotation of the shoulder. It was originally described by Mackinnon. Now, there is a grading system we use for the management. Both McGowan and Dellen described it with slight variations. There are mild, moderate, and severe grades. In the mild, moderate, mild grade, there is only subjective sensory um, symptoms as well as sensory uh, weakness. While in the moderate, there is both uh, objective sensory as well as motor weakness. And in the severe grade, there is also associated muscle atrophy. Investigations help, such as a cubital tunnel view, nerve conduction velocities, and if there's any mass lesion suspected, ultrasound and MRIs can be done. The management, what, when we treat uh, these conditions, we base it on the, the grade, Dellen grade. And in the mild cases, we do a conservative management. Moderate, we plan for a in-situ decompression and then severe grades and anterior transposition is done. The non-operative management, patient is advised to avoid positioning the elbow in acute flexion and avoid tricep strengthening exercises. Static sprinting by just using a towel wrap around the elbow when you go to sleep at night gives a lot of relief and certain exercises, it is nerve gliding exercises. You can see it. Uh, Dr. Anil demonstrating by flexing the elbow and extending the wrist. The nerve is stretched. Surgical decompression originally was described by Osborne in 1954. Simple decompression um, by releasing the fascia over the ulnar nerve, extending from the medial intermuscular septum, the um, ligament of arcade obstructors, and down to the FCU branch, uh, the FCU muscle. Make sure that you test the stability of the nerve by flexing the joint after the procedure. If it is unstable, you may have to go for an anterior transposition. The well, most important structure to identify during surgery is the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve because neuromas of these produce very severe pain and is one of the major complications. Endoscopic cubital tunnel decompression also has been described initially by Sai, and uh, it's a, not a very difficult procedure. In most severe grades, the anterior transposition of the nerve is preferred. You can have either a both, oh, either an open or an endoscopic procedure. The open procedures, every orthopedic and plastic surgeon knows, they divide the three types, subcutaneous, intramuscular, and submuscular. I prefer the subcutaneous transposition because I am worried whether the intramuscular and submuscular produces more nerve compression. This is a video of the short video of the procedure, speeded up. The original, the initial part is the cubital tunnel decompression, the in-situ decompression here, the nerve with the uh, middle antibrachial cutaneous nerve is identified, the ulnar nerve is carefully looped, and then the cubital fascia released, you can see the compressive band. Any branches such as the articular branch or the FCU branch can be intraneurally lie so that you don't have to actually sacrifice it. And then uh, the medial intermuscular septum is dissected out and a pouch for anterior transposition of the nerve in the, under the fascia is done. And then the uh, intermuscular septum is excised and the nerve transposed. An adiposophacial suture prevents the resubluxation of the ulnar nerve. The other procedure that is quite popular, I think, in the US is a medial epicondylectomy 
I have no experience with this, but good to excellent results have been reported. Some of the rare cases, uh, such as a ganglion in the cubital tunnel, the other one was a foreign body when this patient fell on his elbow and had uh, some stone embedded in his ulnar nerve. It's interesting that meta-analysis of various procedures for cubital tunnel does not show a significant difference in the final result between simple decompression, transposition, or epicondylectomy. So Kang et al. proposed a stability-based surgery that after doing a simple decompression, if you flex the elbow and if the nerve subluxate, go on and continue to do an anterior transposition. We generally follow this in our patients also. In case of tardy ulnar palsy, there is no role for conservative management. As soon as patient becomes symptomatic, go and do the anterior transposition. There are papers uh, indicating correction of the valgus angle. In case of cubitus valgus, you do a distal humerus osteotomy followed by an anterior transposition and has been found to give good results. We don't do this. There's a boy who developed tardy ulnar palsy pretty early actually when he was only 14 and that was post-operatively he developed full correction of his claw. Last few years we've been doing anterior transposition and with endoscopic assistance and we reported this recently in the JBJS. Advantage is that the incision, shorter recovery time but there is a learning curve. This is a video. We make the small uh, one inch incision. The nerve is identified and looped with a vessel loop using a speculum a subcutaneous tunnel is made and the speculum is opened up and using endoscopic assistance the fascia over the nerve is carefully incised without damaging the nerve and the nerve is freed same thing is uh, done distally and that is the splits the fco heads so that the nerve can be released fully. Then an anterior pouch is developed again and using a stab incision with a uh, silastic loop is drawn forwards and the nerve transposed anteriorly. Subcutaneous uh, sutures prevents nerve from coming back uh, to its original place. So it's to summarize the gold standard for diagnosis of cubital tunnel syndrome is a clinical testing. Mild grades respond to conservative management. Simple cubital tunnel release in moderate grade and ulnar nerve transfer in severe grades is our preferred method of treatment. Always be aware of leprosy. And in tardy ulnar nerve palsy, early ulnar nerve transposition is advised. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Benun, for that. Any questions, uh, Dr. Warrior? There is one question from Dr. Karan, and he wants to know the role of cubital tunnel view x-rays. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karan, for that question. Cubital tunnel view x-rays are usually done when you suspect some kind of a bony osteophyte or uh, any uh, deformity of that cubital tunnel. You, you, you sometimes get it in all these old elbow injuries where you can see that the osteophyte is pointing into the cubital tunnel and then that is one of the causes of the nerve getting compressed. So you have to take extra care to remove that osteophyte also while you're doing any other procedure, any of these procedures. Would you say that ultrasound is better than uh, an X-ray now? We actually use ultrasound a lot because, as I said, you know, many of the patients whom we see can also be leprosy. So ultrasound really helps in identifying a thickened nerve. So in, in, in fact, nowadays, routinely, we are using ultrasound for identifying nerve thickening or any other pathology of the nerve. So ultrasound definitely is a better investigation, but you know, the x-rays also have its role when you think of a bony pathology. Vinu, I, I saw you uh, putting those markings there, the measurement. So is it is there anything like a minimally minimal distance you have to uh, 
do for releasing this? Are there any intro uh, kind of landmarks for you? How far you yeah. might want to go proximally and distally? The first two inches, it's like eight centimeters distally and 10 centimeters proximally we mark so that that is the extent of our release. So the speculum is usually about 10 centimeters long. And uh, when you put that speculum, you really raise a subcutaneous tunnel 10 centimeters uh, proximally and about eight centimeters distally so that you know that you are releasing all the way down because uh, from the medial intermuscular septum, the arcade of Struthers, it is about 10 centimeter distance from the medial epicondyle. So that is what we mark when we do the procedure. So this holds good for your open procedures or would you... It holds good for the open procedure also. You know, you, you can get a, a reasonable assistance and uh, with a good uh, retractor, you can go right up all the way up also. Yes. There's another question. When would you plan for a claw correction with cubital tunnel? Generally... Um, you know, many of these patients will continue to have claw because in a tardy ulnar palsy, they come quite late. So it may not be that every time you do an anterior transposition, the claw, the deformity corrects. And we do a claw correction. We usually wait for at least six months to one year to see if the claw disappears. And the patient has really a complaint. And um, if the patient really complains of a claw deformity later after a year, then we consider telling him that there is an option of claw correction. So we don't do it immediately or you know before that. As you did demonstrate, I think it corrected spontaneously and you didn't need yeah. to do anything. That is true. And one of the reasons that that was a younger child and uh, you know came very early, which is not usually the case. You know, uh, what are your views on... Uh doing a AIN to ulnar nerve transfer in the presence of these situations? And do you believe in the concept of supercharging your ulnar nerve? Um, and because I'm sure Christine has done some work with Susan McKinnon on that. And um, I'm, I'll, we'll certainly give it to Christine to answer, but I'll, I'd love to see what you think. As a routine, I don't do it. I do it for ulnar nerve injuries, proximal ulnar nerve injuries, but... Uh, for these cubital tunnel syndromes and tardy ulnar nerve palsy, there is always the likelihood of nerve recovery by the primary surgery. Maybe that is the reason. And uh, I know I know there are a lot of papers about that. There are some papers about that. But uh, my experience personally with uh, the supercharging has not been very good. Christine, what do you, what do you think? I know you spent some time doing that stuff, so... Yeah, um, uh, so I'm a little bit biased, but I but I think that I think the idea of the AIN to distal ulnar in the patients who have severe um, uh, motor loss is um, is extremely helpful. I mean, the the otherwise, if they're going to get better, that you're going to wait for a couple of years for the nerve to regenerate uh, down, and um, and I think the motor loss to the hand is a huge functional impairment. Marco, do you do uh, AIN transfers to the in bad ulnar uh, yeah, we, um It's a great question, Chai. Uh, I've done a few, more than a few actually, but my results haven't been quite as successful as Susan's or even um, Steve Moran, who's in our group, who's done quite a few and he's published on it. But to, to Benu's point, I think the success has been better in people with trauma. Yes rather than people with uh, chronic ulnar uh, uh, cubital tunnel syndrome. So, and I, I think that's true. I think that's, a, that's, that's uh, a, a good point. So in those trauma cases, I, I have a lower threshold for doing it. I don't have obviously Susan's experience or Steve's, so um, maybe I should stick to it more and give it more, more of a chance, but um, my results to date haven't been extraordinarily great. You know, that's a, uh... I think something you said just got me thinking because Binu was talking about the Magan grading and I try to tell my trainees to learn about it, but so few of them are actually interested in learning about the Magan grades. <laughs> and I, I find it very interesting because when you see Magan 3, do you oftentimes or e even maybe relatively frequently see recovery of motor bulk, I mean muscle bulk, because I've seen it in young patients. 
But after the age of 30, I have never seen a Bhagavan 3 come back. Maybe I'm doing something not quite right then. What do you think, Binu? Even if the bulk doesn't come back, they do, uh, many of them actually develop about grade 3 power. That is, mm-hmm. the claw disappears. Sure. And there is some sensory improvement. So I still feel that even in a grade 3, you should go ahead and do the uh, transposition. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. No question. The, the recovery may not, it's not grade five, uh, you know, they don't huh. get back to normal, but the clawing, uh, you know, gets better. So yeah, does the sensation. I was going to ask you and tell me if I'm wrong here. I find that patients who have acute ulnar nerve dysfunction like a laceration are profoundly impaired, whereas those who develop ulnar nerve uh, pathology slowly and incrementally compensate quite well, surprisingly. Do you feel that happens? Except if they are symptomatic, you know, the <laughs> patients who are really symptomatic. Uh, but yeah, claw, they may only, you know, they try to uh, do some uh, movements like trick movements that helps them uh, to do their function routinely. But still, they are, they are debilitated. I cannot say that, um, you know, they, they are not totally, they will always f- feel that their grip has become weak uh, sure. and uh, yeah. the sensation is less. Yeah. But in, in, in India, I think uh, the Hansen's, especially uh, early claws, as you said, the slow, progressive kind of claw, they do come to us early because they, they find it difficult to mix rice. You know, yes. that's one of the few things they come very early to us. So we, we, can, we can catch them early in that sense. So this is a their daily routine thing. So that is how they come and express their uh, disability. Uh, uh, there, is, there is another question. If the NCV doesn't, if the nerve conduction studies do not pick up a cubital tunnel syndrome, would you still go ahead with your release simply on the based on the symptoms? That's a very good question. I, I in my clinical practice, I don't give that much of uh, regard to the NCV for cubital tunnel syndrome. Many times when we do it, uh, the you know the neurophysiologist uh, says it's normal. And uh, there are a lot of papers about the inching technique, which uh, some of our hospital is not doing it. You know, uh, probably they are too busy or I don't know whether, uh, why. But if you do an inching technique, you may find that there is a segment where there is um, a conduction block. While when you take the conduction of the whole nerve, that may not be very evident because some nerve fibers may be escaping. So here, unlike carpal tunnel syndrome, in cubital tunnel syndrome, our experience with nerve conduction velocities have not been, you know, it's not in, included in that. It should not be always positive to do a surgery. No. Then, Bino, what would be your, like Mukun mentioned, nocturnal discomfort as being one of those pathognomonic things that would lead him to release it, even if he doesn't have evidence uh, to support it? So, what would be the symptoms? that you would say would make you more inclined towards surgery? Yeah, more than symptoms. Uh, surgery is more with signs. When you have objective weakness, objective sensory loss, that is when I go for surgery. And before that, the, the milder ones, where you have a subjective tingling and numbness, uh, without obvious claw or any, any of those, or muscle atrophy, um, you know, this was uh, my time with Harold Kleinert in uh, Louisville. He said, hey, Dr. Thomas, all I tell my patients is to wrap a towel around the elbow. And uh, you know, I tell that to my patients. They do. Uh, actually, many of them say that uh, you know, it's disappeared. And here I have to add, uh, you know, I, I give these uh, B6, B12 capsules and sometimes Prigabalin for these conservative treatments uh, for the patients who might treat conservatively. And a percentage of them actually gets better and then they don't come back. Or maybe they come back to you, Sudhir, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't see them. So obviously they do better. Some pa- some patients do improve with conservative management itself. So, Binu, there, is there any particular brace or splint do you use for uh, milder cases as a part of conservative management? I mean, towel is one, but then... Only, they, only, they... only, only a towel wrap. We don't give any of those uh, hard plastic splints, hard thermoplastic splints or anything, no. Christine, uh, any, anything you would yeah. recommend? I, I think that I, I have found um, profound non-compliance with uh, hard 
um, splints is that everybody wants to go into an elbow bent position when they're sleeping. So I, it's a lot of patient education. And when you wake up at night and your, your hand feels numb, your finger feels numb, start training yourself to go into more arm extended positions. And, um, and we use elbow pads, but some in some method to, um, to pad the ulnar nerve. And I think particularly with patients who, who partially sublux, it makes the, when they go into elbow flexion, the, the nerve is just vulnerable for more compression. So at night, when you go into the elbow bent position, and then it's, it's a little bit of pressure against the bed against you, but for a long period of time, um, make the symptoms more prominent when you wake up in the morning. And if you irritate the nerve at night, it makes every action that happens during the day um, more, um, it takes less force to bring on symptoms. So I think those patients who have mild symptoms, you can re or mild to moderate symptoms, you can really um, decrease those symptoms by um, elbow pad or somehow padding it at night and a lot of ed education to get out of elbow bent positions and then leaning on it. And so initially we have patients wear the elbow pad all the time. And part of it is just to educate them of when they are bending their elbow and leaning on it because people don't really know. You could be um, a, somebody who's driving a, a truck and your arm is always um, leaning on the, um, on the door and always putting pressure, but you don't really think about it. Yeah. And then I think, um, I think the, um, again, the nerve um, mo mobilization and all of those things going on. Right. There's, Anil, there's one question, uh, a distal transfer with anterior transposition in a tardy palsy, when would you indicate it? A distal transfer along with your anterior transposition. Yeah, I think Talking about a one question. Tendon transfer? I suppose it's a distal nerve transfer. There's one more question corollary to that is how late a tardy palsy have you seen? So uh, when we can take both, like if it's too late and then you want to add a distal transfer or would you go to a tendon transfer? Yeah, so it's very difficult to, you know, for the patient also to tell you when exactly you developed uh, muscle wa wa wasting or uh, weakness, but they would say, Usually they come within a, a year or even up to two years, I would still go for a um, nerve uh, decompression and then wait. That is my philosophy. I wait and uh, if they do not recover, I, I go for a clock correction. But um, my as I told you, my experiences with uh, supercharging and distal nerve transfers, I don't routinely do that. Yeah, Marco, I, uh... Marco, any quick comments? For that. Uh, I, I, I tend to agree with Benu. That's sort of been my take on it. Um, you know, it certainly is attractive to do a nerve transfer. It, it doesn't burn any bridges, but I have had complications with those incisions. They're fairly sizable and, yeah. and people who are diabetic, you know, I've had wound hissance and wound infections related to it. So it's not trivial. It's often sold as a, well, there, you have nothing to lose kind of thing, but you do. And, um, I think it's uh, I think it's important to bear that in mind when you when you're discussing with your patients. Binu, so I have one question about uh, weird symptoms. I have a small subset of patients who have confirmed either ulnar nerve instability or compression, basically ulnar nerve dysfunction of the cubital tunnel, but they complain of proximal arm pain and upper scapular pain, and I cannot explain that anatomically but I have been impressed by how they get relieved of their symptoms. Do you have any comments about that? Have you seen that? Not that I can uh, recall, but I suppose any compressive neuropathy, you can have proximal symptoms also, like carpal tunnel syndrome, many of them present with uh, a diffuse uh, yeah. kind of uh, you know, complaints, which recovers when you release the median nerve. Interestingly, Chaitanya, uh, yeah. radi radial tunnel, you get that. It's very, very typical where they have these radiation up and down. Uh, radial tunnel, always they come and always they show the symptoms this way. They, it goes up and comes down. And then I know that it's not lateral epicondyl, it's the radial tunnel syndrome. It, it happens very often with the radial tunnel. Similar kind of presentation. 
and it may absolute... even be like a double crush uh, probably you know something there may be some element of crush proximally also right uh, yeah. what if your electrical diagnostic studies do not show that right the same thing happens with radial tunnel absolute right. nerve conditions are normal yeah i think we'll go ahead i'll sure. i'll have to invite myself for the next talk Good evening, everyone. Uh, life was uh, quite simple one year back when we conducted this uh, Indo-US hand conference at Manipal, and people could physically come down to our small town here. Marco was here, Chaitanya was here, Ruby was here, Abhijit, Binu, all these people, and Dr. Warrior sir. All of them uh, had a good time here. And then in 2021. the hand surgeons all got compressed into these small boxes of uh, zoom and other platforms and uh, that is the theme of this webinar of compressive neuropathies and coming to my topic of upper limb compressive neuropathies the uncommon ones we have seen the carpal tunnel and the cubital ones which are very common uh, the uncommon ones involving the radial tunnel uh, or the posterior interosseous nerve itself <coughs> which is called as the supinator syndrome and wartenberg syndrome uh, basically the radial nerve and then you have the median nerve with pronator and anterior interosseous nerve syndrome and the ulnar nerve with the gans canal syndrome now uh, all these uncommon uh, compressive neuropathies we need to have a high degree of suspicion and also we need to rule out proximal lesions including the spine and sometimes symmetrical lesions can be there and it might point out to inflammatory pathology like any of these parsonage turner syndromes or any of the neuropathies and always remember that anomalous connections can cause a lot of confusion like your martin gruber anastomosis kind of lesions can cause uh, confusions in your diagnosis now the general workup of all these compressive neuropathies would be uh, basically clinical examination but sometimes x rays can show few features like supracondylar process in pronator syndromes malunions exostosis tumors MRI can give a uh, idea of extrinsic causes of compression like tumor or hematoma especially in pronator syndrome the EMG and nerve conduction studies might be helpful and sometimes might not be especially in these kind of uncommon uh, neuropathies ultrasound is an emerging uh, uh, technology for uh, these where we talk of nerve gliding so nerve diameters dynamic imaging is is coming in a big way and sometimes we have to resort to the serial or differential nerve blocks to see where is the problem the treatment basically is first line is always conservative in this no hurry to do surgeries in these patients almost 3 to 6 months of some combinations of nsaids rest activity modification and therapy sometimes the braces might or the splints might work sometimes might not uh, steroid injections again is a, a mainstay of the non operative management and finally the last resort would be surgery with any of the bebo means like open or mini open or endoscopic the radial nerve uh, neuropathy is uncommon one the very interesting one is the radial tunnel syndrome if somebody has been treating lateral epicondylitis for a long time and there is no resolution you should start looking at radial tunnel syndrome and this can if the compression increases in this tunnel it can go into posterior interosseous nerve syndrome so the basic differentiation in the terminology says the radial tunnel syndrome basically means a lot of pain there for the patient but if you call if you want to call it tin syndrome or supinator syndrome means it has already gone to uh, a paralysis or a palsy now it patients come with the fatigue kind of a heavy arm syndrome uh, features pain is the predominant feature and intermittent on specific activities very very specific uh, activity related kind of uh, symptoms here <clears throat> there's always sometimes the radiation patients come and tell it goes up and down like this and the class there is always a classic tender area 5 cm distal to the lateral condyle over the radial tunnel and it always gives good relief post decompression uh, there are five potential sites of compression in this one is the fibrous bands between the brachialis and brachioradialis there's a leash of henry which comes in there's a medial proximal edge of ecr which can be quite tight the arcade of frost is the main culprit most of the times and the distal edge of supinator is again one of the things so that is where the entire radial uh, the radial tunnel spans here and these are the five potential sites of compression so as i said arcade of frost is uh, one of the main culprit occurs in about 30% of the adults it's not seen in mature fetuses so it's thought to develop from repeated rotational movements of forearms so the proximal tendinous edge of the supinator is is the arcade of frost 
and sometimes the superficial belly can completely tenderness in some patients like this uh, some, something like this here clinical evaluation the classic site of tenderness 5 cm distal and we also use this rule of nine kind of test where we divide this into nine compartments the medial side is a control and the lateral side is the one where the nerve passes and these two the one and two are quite painful uh, on causes compression there is other tests like modsley's and cousin's test to differentiate between lateral cord epicondylitis uh, surprising electrodiagnostic studies are usually normal in uh, radial tunnel syndrome and sometimes as a said sequential blocks might help to see whether where is the problem here mri may show muscle edema and we been using dynamic usg in these situations where we uh, kind of image nine different uh, sites uh, in the neutral position pronation and supination at the entry and exit and in the tunnel itself and look for the cross sectional area of this uh, nerve diameters and compare it to the opposite side and we are finding a lot of differences between this Uh, the affected side and the normal side. We also look at the leash of Henry as a qualitative part of the study and see how many vessels are there, or how much of compression probably can happen with these uh, kind of imaging here. The management, as I said, non-operative, but surprisingly, as I said here, if you put a tennis elbow brace on a patient with radial tunnel syndrome, actually the pain increases. Uh, so that's one thing we need to look at. Local steroid injections. and concomitant to this elbow can compound decision making sometimes almost up to 40% of the literature quotes as having both these conditions together now the decompression can happens either between the brachioradialis and the ecrl or from between the extensors and the edc itself one of the planes uh, we generally go between the brachioradialis and the ecrl so here is where you have this uh, patient uh, the the part the demarcation is between these two if you see this is more reddish versus this where the sheath is quite thin here over the brachioradialis itself and then once you go in if your plane is correct you'll, you'll go all the way down uh, you can go all the way up rather into the brachialis brachioradialis junction if your plane is correct and then if there are any bands there you can you can actually displace them and then once that is done you you basically uh, uh, separate them out and what you see here is the ecrb edge so this is retracted here and then you see the this is the supinator actually but this is the ecrb coming in here and this tenderness edge can be quite quite tight here and that's where the nerve is coming out here so during pronation and supination that tenderness edge can compress the nerve and can cause pain for the patient so that is the medial edge of the ecrb seen here and that is a classical uh, <clears throat> arcade of frost here and that is where the nerve is coming in if you see a lot of fat there you know that that's where the nerve is so this is what we do we release the whole thing here and then uh, the whole as i said this is one of the patient who had a tenderness uh, kind of a superficial belly completely so that whole thing is released and then you check for the compression here uh, so if you see the nerve is kind of compressed at this point and then you can always check these Uh, pronation supination movements and you see that you know the tenderness edge here this is the entire supinator it's completely free this is the leash of henry in some patients can have multiple vessels from the recurrent branch of the radial artery here and that needs to be cauterized and uh, finally if patient also has any elbow symptoms then we would we would uh, release the uh, origin of the partially ecrb and uh, suture it back in a lax position and that takes care of both the problems in these patients PIN syndrome basically is commonly seen with occupations the repetitive pronosupination like orchestra conductors while in swimmers there could be space of paying lesions in like in rheumatoid arthritis montagia fracture dislocations sometimes atrogenic also biceps repair radial head reconstruction elbow arthroscopy can cause damage to this this is one such case where PIN nerve sheath tumor is seen here which was excised and then reconstructed there with the nerve grafts here there is a gct of post intro i mean proximal radius and then the nerve was completely entrapped patient came with a palsy here which was separated out and patient recovered after the tumor excision uh, superficial radial nerve is called also called as wartenberg syndrome superficial radial nerve compression also called as chiralgia parasthetica it's also called uh, wristband or handcuff disease uh, sometimes close reduction of fractures all can can cause this kind of compression scissoring effect of brachioradialis and ecrl can cause this 
pain dysesthesia on dorsal radial forearm radiating to the thumb and index is a common problem and can sometimes stenal sign can be elicited over this so that is where the two tendons are crossing the brachioradialis and the ecr and the nerve is coming out there and that is the point where it can get irritated and can cause compression there so this is again a operated case outside uh, who came with the scar here with severe dysesthesia in this ear and when we saw that there was a scar tissue entire and the nerve was caught in this there were some sutures also which was released pronator syndrome is a compression neuropathy of the median nerve in the proximal forearm again five classic nerve compression sites the ligament of struthers or supracondylar process the two heads of pronator teres lacertus fibrosus which is the bicipital aponeurosis the fibrous arch of fds and the cancer's muscle so this is a supracondylar process which is seen here and that's where the ligament comes in this is the reference for these photographs here so that is the supracondylar process and that is that is the ligament here through this the ligament is the process is removed the ligament is removed here in this and then the nerve gets free here so that is one case for it a head uh, uh, you know two heads where the nerve is crossing here at this point more than 50% of the cases reported talk about this reason etiology Lacertus fibrosus morely most of the time acts like an exertional kind of syndrome and sometimes partial release of that gives good results fds arch again under the, under the pronator once you retract the pronator you will see this fds arch and that's again uh, the nerve is coming here and the arch can be quite thick in some patients cancer's muscle is an anomalous muscle in a additional fpl muscle coming here and classically causes a and compression here and can cause a syndrome a pronator kind of syndrome and in an syndrome the fpl the fdp of the index uh, you know is 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 pa paralyzed so patient can't do this classic o sign here that's called as a kilo evans uh, syndrome here uh, usually fourth or fifth decade presentation vague aching pain in the proximal forearm and paresthesia along the median nerve distribution there might be good decrease grip and pain strength and generalized weakness as well as loss of fine motor skills tenderness in the proximal forearm on palpation sometimes indentation of the flexor pronator mass by lacertus fibrosus and motor strength in all the median or a and innervated muscles can be reduced and tenal phalanx and even carpal compression test can be positive in this this is a pronator compression test always compare with the normal side this is a pronator teres compression you do pronation against resistance in about between 0 to 45 degrees of flexion This is for lacertus fibrosus. You flex the elbow to 100 to 135 again. Paresthesia with resisted elbow flexion and forearm supination, and this is for middle finger uh, PIP joint against resistance for FDS compression. The last one is the Guyens canal, uh, first described in 1861. Uh, there are three zones here based on where which part of the nerve is involved. You know, it could be superficial sensory branch, hypothenar branch, or deep motor branch. uh you know from this so hi hamet hiatus as the nerve goes in they could be at different levels the compression can happen now this is a, a classic uh, uh, you know picture of the guyens canal release where you see all the three uh, different branches this we had a case of a, a ganglion sitting here over the tunnel here and the ganglion is removed here this is a hook of hamet fracture non union with allen of palsy very close the nerve is close related to this here and the hook was you know resected here This was a foreign body entrapment again, causing damage to the nerve here. This is a glass piece here pressing on that nerve there. This was a blunt injury trauma here in this area, and then patient came with significant paresthesia, and that is the neurolysis of this nerve. So, in summary, most uncommon compressive neuropathies are diagnosed with high degree of suspicion. Always rule out proximal compression in these patients, and remember that anatomical barriers and amylase connections can always be there, and so your diagnosis should be more accurate before we go in. and surgery follows only after a thorough trial of a conservative management never rush uh, for surgeries in these patients especially with this kind of uncommon presentations thank you so much for your attention anil you can't be asking questions there are a whole volley of questions for you well the first one the first one is uh, uh, probably you answered that in your talk as well uh, 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 in the beginning uh, there's someone who congratulated you on your nice demonstration and said any role of conservative management for rts and i think you did mention that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't so yes you should try that but uh, maybe it works maybe it doesn't and if it doesn't then you need to go on to what anil has already discussed the second question is when do you release the i think it's the ecrb it says errb but i suppose it's ecrb 
along with radial tunnel release where do you reattach it lax after the release uh if the clinical examination shows both lateral epicondylitis and tunnel radial tunnel that's where when we plan to release the ecrp and the 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 decision is basically in drop into a, how much is the tightness of the ecrp is one that is for the radial tunnel itself but if it's there is a lateral epicondylitis associated with that i would still go all the way to the origin of that near the lateral condyle curate out that area and then release partially release this it's not a full release it's always a partial release and then just suture it back to the tendon itself in a slightly lax position and a lot of times these patients do have some middle finger uh, extensor lag for usually about 3 to 6 weeks and then they always you know do well so we start them on strengthening exercises of the crb after about 3 weeks once the wound settles down so it's it's back sutured back the part of the tendon which is released is sutured back to the main tendon itself but slightly in a lax position and you actually can feel the laxity as you are suturing and that's your clinical decision or interop decision how you do it the last question is after a radial tunnel release patients are initially okay and then they come back with the same pain do you have any similar experiences a uh, couple of cases uh, because we have laid open the nerve now there could be some amount of uh, you know additions and scar contractures and that's where again we do a post op ultrasound to see what's happening with the nerve if there are any additions or any you know we start them on uh, gliding exercises the nerve gliding exercises otherwise unless you have you know misdiagnosed it for something else and then you've done a radial tunnel release so that that should not happen otherwise If most of the time we see a very very good clinical response post study compression and i think we have had two cases where there was some amount of scar additions and patients eventually got well in in many in couple of the <clears throat> nerves that you discussed you showed five different places where the nerve could be compressed do you release all of them when you go in for surgery or how do you how do you Uh, uh zoom into the one that you really want to release yes. in a radial tunnel we always check for all the five always so like as i said i put my finger go up and see the any bands there that's the first thing which we start with then of course we uh, go through the arcade and go through the superficial belly very rarely distally there might be some constriction at the superior edge the distal edge and then we go for the ecrb the leash of henry is on the way a lot of times they might be very flimsy i really don't think leash of henry can actually compress the pin but otherwise if there are multiple branches we ligate it very carefully because the pin itself is a sensitive nerve so we don't want any damage to the nerve itself in a pronator uh, again uh, most of the times it's it's the release i mean ligament of uh, sruthers and uh, you know that is very rarely seen i mean i've not come across uh, that but the fds arch is there and uh, the way it goes between the pronator heads you need to you know loosen up that area definitely those two will always be there for the pronator syndrome guyans in based on uh, the symptoms you know you so you it can be at three different levels the deep branch or the superficial branch and one of the thing would be to differentiate between cubital and guyans would be the dorsum sens- sensations of the dorsum so that's how we differentiate Yeah, I I'm, I'm not uh, very happy that Mukund is not here because Mukund said <coughs> tends to release the Guyans canal in in most of the uh, carpal tunnel he does. Okay, that's interesting. Because it's just there and he takes a very ulnar incision as you noticed when you yeah. mentioned that. So I would yeah. have liked to ask him that question. There's one last question that just come up and how do you differentiate between the ECRB and the LUCL fibers? uh when you release them i think uh, it is actually more difficult to differentiate between ecrb and edc because they have conjoint tendons as you go towards the origin of it but i don't think you can make a mistake between lucl and the uh, uh, ecrb generally you can make out a plane between them uh there are times i mean literature uh, reports there are times where people have cut through the lucl and made the elbow unstable but you can always find a plane between the ecrb and the the capsule i mean the ligament itself i think it's more difficult if you do an arthroscopic kind of a release sometimes for a tennis elbow where you go through the capsule and then you will have to go to the ecrb 
and that is where if you are not in the plane where you are not above the anterior part of the radial head you might damage the lucl so i think the complication is more when you do an arthroscopic uh, release of uh, lateral i mean i think marco will be speaking on that but uh, the tennis elbow release arthroscopically that would be a complication but if you're going from outside in i think we should not be making that mistake yeah let me ask you this um, you know i i can honestly say that i could count the number of times i've released a radial nerve uh, radial tunnel or a pronator on the fingers of one hand but i could probably count the guillon's canal on my hands and feet so <laughs> do you find the same thing in the indian population that uh, guillon's canal is much more commonly seen than the either of the other two or it's different uh in our practice i think we've seen more of radial tunnel actually uh so we kind of developed a protocol where every other unit in the orthopedic department would refer all the lateral elbow pain to us mm -hmm. and then when you re start really looking at these you start finding them more i mean you you really know that it's definitely a radial tunnel when a lady walks in and tells that i have pain which is going up and down like this it's it's nothing with the neck at all and you repeatedly ask is it something in the neck no and then they say this so we've been finding that uh, very often i mean guyan's canal generally has it's not like a carpal tunnel which has got a radiopathic kind of a group mm -hmm. so there usually is a secondary cause there yeah. but uh, radial tunnel is is is, is an idiopathic kind of a thing. if you really look at it too. can i be a little bit of a devil's advocate and be an agent provocateur and say you may be suffering from selection bias because <laughs> because yeah. you are seeing all the lateral elbow pains you know hammer meet nail kind of situation is that possible 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 but then the other part is not correct which is we don't see more of guyan skin all definitely i mean mm. dr warrior can tell that what is his experience well, how often do you see pronated syndrome very rare very rare i think we have had and, uh, three cases do you, three do you release it the same time as a carpal tunnel or you wait on it because many patients do have when you press on the proximal forearm it's tender and then they have classical carpal tunnel syndrome so do you yeah. do it at the same time or wait no wait wait for a long time go through again both the ncbs and uh, ultrasound for that matter a couple of times and then wait that's that's exactly where you know a good um, uh, electrical study helps you so if there is a definite problem at the wrist that's much easier to release it's like a double crush syndrome yeah you know marco what is your experience with uh, radial tunnel at um, at uh, mayo and do you, how do you guys come to that conclusion because clearly um, on the east coast we have some people who are big proponents of radial tunnel releases how is it out there i remember in my over the last 10 years my practice with radial tunnel mirrors a little bit of anils you know i see a lot more of it <laughs> and actually yeah. it was something that um i used to dread to treat because you know i i read the the chapters from dean soterianos and others who said gee this is prognosis is terrible the complications are high the success is low but Over the last 10 years, you know, with the appropriate indications and the right diagnosis, these patients get better, particularly the pain. The pain gets better and and it's more or less a dialogue of um, you know, identifying the right patient. And uh, ultrasound has been hugely helpful for me you know, when I when I look at this and I I've gotten better at it, but it might be in part because you know, we're a referral center and we get cases that people are sort of scratching their heads about and over the but it's been a dramatic sort of turn if you will in my in 20 years this is my 20th year of practice first 10 years versus the last 10 years it's really been a dramatic turn in terms of uh seeing these cases and i i mean i'm doing one or two a month which is extraordinary you know yes, much, much much more than i and i yeah. first 10 years maybe i did eight total you know <laughs> No, I, I agree with you. I, I had exactly what Anil and you say. Be very selective in whom you select, and the, if you select them correctly, they are remarkably happy. Yeah, but I've been many of them have been through. Them. Many of them have been through multiple doctors, and they're often work comp or or something, and they're just desperate for a solution. And and um, you know, of course, we we still you know temper expectations, and you know, and thankfully, I I haven't had anyone sort of have a. 
a, you know, a temporary palsy afterwards. And that's always a, a potential concern. But, um, I, you know, I think, uh, I think it's actually a procedure that I start to look forward to now, <laughs> which I would never have guessed. I would never have guessed that I would look forward to treating a, a um, radial tunnel. Yeah, hey, Anil, do you use MR neurography at all in your practice? Uh, we've used it for uh, brachial plexus uh, uh -huh. for a particular study. That's it. But otherwise, routinely, we don't use it. We don't use not it. for this condition? No, not for this. We're, we're very happy with the ultrasound protocol right. which we're doing now. It's almost ready for publication. We're doing it now on the normal people also just to see what's the diameters and everything. So once that's done, I think uh, this, will, this will go for this method of this dynamic ultrasound at three different places in three different positions. I think that's not described, so we'll send it for publication soon. But as Marco was telling, I mean, we've, we've seen ladies coming and telling, I've got three injections here at the lateral condyle and I absolutely don't have any pain. And every time I go to your doctor, they just in inject there. And then once we've released it, they're so happy and they always yeah. come back and thank you for that. Yeah. I think, I think this is where we should get in, Christine. <laughs> yes. Uh, there, there's this patient who's, who's not doing well. We think it's a tennis elbow. We've been playing around with this patient. We've put him through various medications and all sorts of exercises and splints. Not doing too well. Christine, over to you. What would you do this? Uh, and how right. would you do I, I get that little. I get that little piece of paper that says assess and treat. Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's worded differently from our side. Get rid of this one from my consulting room. Well, um, I think in a lot of these patients is, um, is everybody, people tend to focus just on like whether it's lateral epicondylitis or it's pain in the forearm, um, just to that one site. And I think in many of those patients, it's important to look at the whole upper extremity. And um, the patients that um, like previously described that have, you know, scapular pain or, um, or lateral arm pain is they maybe have other musculoskeletal or neuro, neural um, either entrapments or muscle imbalances that need to be um, addressed just with exercises or whether it's splinting or whether it's um, neuromobilization. But if somebody, and it, and it, it can go either proximal to distal or distal proximal. So if a patient has um, pain from uh, lateral epicondylitis or radial tunnel, maybe they alter how they do something and they alter the position of their arm in order to minimize that discomfort. And then what happens is they get a, a new um, problem from a new muscle imbalance or um, uh, develop another um, abnormal movement pattern. And so I think in a lot of those patients, how I would approach it is um, proximal to distal and look at the movement patterns and do they have um, uh, muscle imbalances in the cervical scapular area and other areas of nerve compression that are contributing to those symptoms. There's one last question. Uh, do you get an MRI to look for other elbow pathology like plica. Yeah, I mean, that's an indication for MRI where you want to rule out other things. Could be, you know, something intra-articular kind of a thing, or uh, especially if there's some amount of weakness, then definitely an MRI is indicated. So I'm talking of PIN syndrome versus radial tunnel. So there definitely we go for a MRI because we want to know why that there is a weakness or a palsy. But routinely, otherwise, uh, most studies tell that MRI might show some muscle edema and things like that, but otherwise, not very useful. So we have not done it. Uh, but if there is some amount of weakness showing up in the extensors, we straight away ask for MRI. Let me add a comment. Uh, one of the st uh, studies we did, we looked at all these uh, patients with some nerve compression. Uh, we looked at the MRIs. Whoever they had, patients had MRIs, we found a few of them having an intra-neural uh, ganglion cyst, you know, and uh, finally we found that they are actually leading to the joint. So it's like a Baker cyst through the uh, nerve uh, twig that is the articular branch, and it from the joint it comes out, goes all the way down the nerve. So uh, my colleague Dr. Anil and uh, our radiologist they did a lot of work on this, and they picked up quite a few patients. So it's an intra-neural ganglion cyst. We've published it also. So that is something where, where an MRI is useful to identify, especially when there is, you're not sure about the pathology. Yeah. 
because hey, even, even the te- sorry sorry chaitanya no uh, i was just going to say uh, the uh, protocol for uh, ultrasound imaging uh, it would be great for you to share it with us you know at an opportune moment because sure. i'm really interested in following that it seems it seems fantastic sure we'll do that we'll do that yeah because uh, uh, i mean answering to binu's comment uh, because even the tennis elbow doesn't show anything on mri most of the time so there could be some signal change at the most that's it yeah. but otherwise uh, you know or unless there's a, a frank tear otherwise so again it might not be useful in either ways but this is interesting this intraneural ganglion is interesting shall we move ahead yes yeah uh, waiting for marco's lecture on um, tennis elbow Oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Rizzo, and I'm one of the orthopedic and hand surgeons here at the Mayo Clinic. And as I get ready to share my screen, I uh, would um, uh, introduce my, my charge as uh, lateral epicondylitis. Um, is there any science in its management? Um, I have no relevant conflicts related to this presentation. Um, special thanks again to Neil and Chai for the privilege of being part of this meeting. I had the honor of being here a year ago or there a year ago. Uh, and even though it's virtual, it's a great privilege to come and share and learn. When we look at lateral epicondylitis, it was uh, uh, initially named uh, a lawn tennis arm, and it's evolved into what we consider now tennis elbow. It's very common. It affects 1% to 3% of adults annually, a disease of middle age, no real gender predominance, but it does affect the dominant arm. It's uh, more often than not. Uh, overexertion is uh, a key uh, uh, component to this, as well as re- whether it be repetitive wrist extension, repetitive pronosupination, or abnormal uh, swing, or ECRB activation. Uh, recreational activities such as tennis, racquetball, squash, and fencing are commonly associated with this, and occupational hazards such as meat cutting, plumbing, painting, raking, and weaving. Pathoanatomy uh, around the lateral elbow, uh, ECRL and BR are more anterior um, and proximal. The anconius will lie posteriorly to the uh, lateral epicondylitis. Uh, the ECRB and EDC, uh, or the common extensor origin, are, the, are really the muscle tendons that are involved, and uh, more the ECRB than the EDC. And the ECU lies more posteriorly. Tendonitis is actually a misnomer. It's more of a tendonitis that evolves into tendinosis. And the term angiofibroblastic hyperplasia was coined by Dr. Robert Nerschel in the 70s, which really helped to advance our understanding of the pathophysiology and also treatment. Most patients will have pain localized in the lateral epicondyle or five millimeters distal. Provocative tests such as the chairs or Mills test can uh, uh, confirm uh, pain at the lateral epicondyle. More commonly, pain with resisted wrist extension is easy to do in clinic and uh, will help confirm the diagnosis. The differential is quite extensive, but uh, primarily a radial tunnel syndrome needs to be uh, vetted out. There's about a 5% coexistence of radial tunnel with lateral epicondylitis. Uh, the uh, Mosley test, which is visualized in the schematic below to, uh, with uh, pain with resisted middle finger extension, is more associated with radial tunnel, but none of these tests are super uh, uh, sensitive uh, and specific. Um, and radial tunnel can be a diagnosis of, uh, of exclusion sometimes. Um, the uh, a pain more local uh, distally at three to four centimeters from the lateral epicondyle is also associated more with radial tunnel. Imaging uh, plain x rays uh, uh, do show some calcification in about uh, 15% of cases, but very rarely does it affect our treatment on, uh, plan. Ultrasound is becoming very much an important part of diagnosis as well as treatment for this condition, and we're looking for epicoic areas. Uh, I mean, hypochoic areas, intrasubstance tears, and fluid and tendon thickening. Uh, sensitivity continues to improve with more repetition. The, M- the MRI uh, can be a uh, helpful at rolling out other path- well, pathologies, and it can be very sensitive and specific. It's important to remember that asymptomatic patients have often uh, enhancement on their images as well. Let's talk a little bit about treatment. And before you embark on uh, treatment, it's important to remember that spontaneous cure is probable. Uh, 80% of patients with lateral epicondylitis are better at a year. Um, so it's very important to recommend about six to 12 months of non operative treatment before considering uh, surgical intervention. Non operative treatments are, are varied, include NSAIDs, therapy, bracing, and injection, as well as some other additional modalities, which I'll touch upon. Um, 
the use of diclofenac uh, was uh, uh, studied uh, prospectively in a double-blinded study uh, versus placebo and did, did have better pain relief and grip strength, but uh, unfortunately, the side effects associated with it uh, made it difficult for the authors to recommend it. Um, insects, uh, uh, topical insects are more hit or miss, uh, and there's really no uh, particular oral insect that's been shown to make it uh, to be better than one or the other. Physical therapy is a very common treatment uh, and uh, remains a staple in care. Uh, it, it's a, a basically forearm strengthening, flexibility, and endurance. Uh, Amto and phonophoresis are very commonly utilized. It's noted that uh, PT improves patient satisfaction sooner and grip strength sooner, and the, there is a link between frequency and length of therapy. Splinting is a, is a commonly offered uh, intervention, wrist splints, and forearm-based counterforce braces, as you can see on this image. The wrist splint does carry a, a, some uh, limitation with extension and can be frustrating for patients, whereas the counterforce brace, I think, lends itself to more use. The uh, When studied uh, uh, competitively, there's no difference between uh, braces in terms of efficacy. Uh, numerous injections are, have been proposed, and I'll touch on this in a little bit. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy has been popularized and uh, studied. Uh, two uh, prospective studies have been uh, performed, uh, one showing no difference and one showing uh, a significant difference in pain reduction at 12 weeks. Uh, Botox has been studied through a meta-analysis and 10 papers uh, demonstrating uh, moderate effect on pain, uh, but no real uh, change in grip strength. But the present literature supports Botox in the treatment of chronic lateral epicondylitis. So what treatment is superior? Uh, uh, Crow and colleagues looked at a, a meta-analysis of 17 trials, uh, eight treatments analyzed, as you can see. They ultimately concluded that most were better than placebo. However, there was a lot of bias in these studies, and they cautioned against that and demonstrated that only one study was considered to have low bias. They further uh, did a prospective randomized study of their own comparing uh, PRP steroids and saline and found that at three months there was really no difference in follow-up, uh, no difference in the outcome between the three treatment groups. Uh, another uh, randomized study comparing steroids to naproxen found that there was really no difference in a year. TEDx was popularized by one of my predecessors here, Dr. Bernie Mori, who trained me. And uh, it's uh, deemed as an uh, office-based procedure that's uh, under local anesthesia, very quick, uh, early recovery, and it's a percutaneous debridement with ultrasound assistance. Uh, more recent studies comparing uh, results in patients with recalcitrant uh, tennis elbow found that uh, 10X is very helpful in improving uh, symptoms. Uh, they did find that uh, associated uh, physical therapy improved the treatment response. Another study comparing PRP to 10X demonstrated that both were equally successful in treating tennis elbow. An interesting study looking at the, from the journal of Chinese, uh, Traditional Chinese Medicine, looking at acupuncture and, and plus massage and blocking therapy uh, versus blocking therapy alone demonstrated that uh, the treatment was effective at 12 months, uh, but there was severe relapse in, uh, by 24 months by both groups, um, which was obviously concerning. Are you frustrated yet? Again, go back to the uh, Syriax. Uh, uh, comment that most of will get better on their own, regardless of what we do. Uh, remember that these are active patients, so uh, try to be sure that they fail a conservative treatment, but it's often hard because they, they are active and they, they want to get better really, really soon. Opera treatment, uh, thankfully, uh, is not very often needed, um, yeah, but it can be successful when chosen. Refractory uh, patients uh, should be refractory to at least six months of non-operative treatment. Make sure there's no other pathologies, and uh, pain is a significant enough indication for surgery. I'm going to focus on mainly just denervation, open, and arthroscopic treatment. Uh, the open treatment, as initially described by Nershaw in 79, was a three centimeter incision centered over a lateral epicondyle, exposing the, the fascia, uh, uh, identifying the common origin of the ECRB and EDC, debriding those areas, potting, in some cases incorporating drilling into the uh, uh, to help uh, with uh, healing as well as uh, reapproximation of tissues, and um, and then a post-op protocol of uh, motion in about two weeks. Uh, there are complications with the open release. Beware of the LCL. Uh, the uh, 
cutaneous branches of nerves, uh, heterotopic bone, and recurrence is a concern. Uh, Nurschel's initial uh, results are pretty good, and most subsequent studies demonstrate the similar results in the properly selected patients. Arthroscopic treatment was popularized, uh, and Champaker had a nice follow-up study, a long-term 10-year follow-up, and demonstrated that uh, results were really quite good. Um, most were much better. There are complications with uh, arthroscopy as well, so it's important to respect that. Um, another study comparing the open arthroscopic and percutaneous found, interestingly, no difference in outcome. Uh, denervation was popularized by Lee Dallin, looking at 30 elbows in 26 patients initially back in 2013, demonstrated that it was 80% successful in treating lateral epicondylitis. A subsequent study uh, from uh, Japan uh, looking at this demonstrated that patients who responded favorably to trials had about a 90% success rate, so they recommended a trial of uh, lidocaine uh, as a uh, as a reassurance that it would likely be successful. Uh, final thoughts on uh, non-operative treatment. Uh, uh, there's really no superior protocol. Keep your patient involved. Uh, be patient with your patients. And, um, and keep in mind that 80-90% will be successful at uh, 6 to 12 months. When considering operative treatment, select wisely. Take your time. Make sure you've exhausted the conservative treatments and treat with what you feel comfortable with. Thank you. Thank you, Paco, for... So oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Rizzo, and I'm one of the orthopedic and hand surgeons here at the Mayo Clinic. And as I get ready to share my screen, I... Uh, would, uh, turn it off, turn it off. It's terrible. <laughs> treat my, my charge is uh, level kind of light. Um, I need to stop sharing. <laughs> Uh, sure I have a relevant conflict related to this presentation, and special thanks again to Neil and Chai for the privilege of being part of this meeting. I had a year ago, a year ago. Uh, and even though it's virtual, it's a great privilege to come and share and learn. Can you uh, text Neeraj? When we look at kind of it was uh, uh, actually deemed. Uh, uh, Pankaj, are you on? Can you call Neeraj, please? What we consider now tennis elbow. It's very common. It affects 1% to 3% of adults annually. Disease of middle age. No real gender predominance, but it does affect the dominant arm. It's, uh, more often than not. Uh, overexertion is uh, a key uh, uh, component to this, as well as re whether it be repetitive wrist extension, repetitive pronosupination. Hopefully he'll get the message. There we go. Perfect. There we go. Thanks. Marco. Uh, it, yeah. We just couldn't get enough of you, man. We all oh, that was awful. In our lives. That's, a, that's a sign from God that this should never have happened. <laughs> Thanks for the revision again, so. <laughs> we won't Bronco. forget who you are. We won't forget who you are and where you are from. <laughs> Any questions, sir? Quite a few. Obviously, this is going to be the most question, answer, intense session of the day I'm sure. Uh, any role of above elbow plasters? Well, you mean splinting? Immobilization? Conservative plaster immobilization. Well, you know, it certainly, I think so. You know, I don't, I don't traditionally do that, but I do, uh, I do favor immobilization for a brief period of time after surgery, of course. And while that's debated, it, I, I think it, it does help. Um, I think it, it's just a difficult sell to patients to, to have an above elbow cast uh, for a period of time. And I think it's, uh, that's been one of the challenges I've seen. With it. I think it'll also make sure they never come back to see you ever again. <laughs> no, it also makes, makes you... Uh, uh, Christine la laugh and be very happy because then you're going to send the patient for elbow mobilization. Chaitanya, there's an interesting social phenomenon there. Uh -huh. A lot of housewives who are very happy when you offer a cast and complete rest for three weeks from their house. <laughs> yes, yes. It, it happens very often when they're, especially yes. in India, when they're in joint families and things like yes. that. And it, it actually helps them. They're very happy. They come and thank, thank us a lot of times. Yes. I've seen that uh, quite a few times, actually. I, I can see that. I understand it. Yes, I, I, I can absolutely see that. There's a question that probably Anil and uh, Marco will have to take together. And it says, um, uh, radial tunnel syndrome requires early intervention and lateral epicondylitis can wait for one year. How do you decide 
when there is a suspicion of both. Uh, and you know, I'll let you. I'll let you go first, and I'll I'm happy to go first. If you want. No, no okay. please, please go ahead. You know, I, I, there's uh, there's some uh, studies that actually uh, there was a study out of Europe that I read years ago. I'm remembering the author, uh, but every time he did a carpal tunnel, every time he did a, a lateral epicondylar treatment, he would he would venture further down, release uh, the the uh, the um, the radial tunnel at the same time, suggesting that these these two conditions sort of coexist. Um, I'm not that bold. I think they are independent. Uh, although even Susan McKinnon describes treating both if they have symptoms of both. Uh, so her threshold for releasing, much like Anil showed in his, uh, his uh, um, uh, presentation, uh, uh, and I've done that before. So there are cases where they coexist, and, and certainly I buy into it, and I, uh, there's not much uh, morbidity to doing that. Um, I don't know, you know, radial tunnel, I don't know that radial tunnel is that acute. You know, it certainly, uh, it certainly uh, would benefit, of course, to have the patient treated right away. But I don't know that you have to rush into radial tunnel treatment and um, and uh, uh, conflicts too much with the, uh, the the dogma to wait on on lateral epicondylitis. Um, but if uh, if the patient's symptomatic enough and they do in fact have both, I have no problem surgically treating the uh, lateral pericondylitis at the same time. For me, it's uh, uh, what is more painful in the terms of uh, you know, I mean, the nerve is the one which should probably go for further compression, and so I would want to release that compared to uh, a tendon which is avascular and it's just got tendinosis which needs to be you know debrided to for it to heal. So. Absolutely no confusion there. I would do the radial tunnel and the tennis elbow at the same time. There is nothing, no, no confusion in terms of should I wait or not. If the symptoms are predominantly of radial tunnel or if the pain is more of the radial tunnel, then do both together. You don't have to wait there. Okay, there's, there's a question uh, which I don't know whether you want to answer, but it says some surgeons recommend a LUCL reinforcement with suture anchors. I think you were very clear when you said you don't want to get near the LUCL. You need to be careful about that. Uh, there's a, also another question which talks about a tennis elbow brace, which you did uh, ever to do in your lecture. Uh, how do they function and how frequently should they be used? Well, I definitely think they're um, an option that I offer everybody, um, more so than the wrist supports. Although the wrist supports can, as, as, a, as studies have shown, they're equally effective. Um, and Neil's point about irritating the PIN is really helpful because you know you, you sometimes will use them and they actually cause worsening symptoms. And I've used that as a diagnostic tool to point more towards a radial tunnel. If they come back and specifically say that it was worse, that makes me think that it could be a uh, radial tunnel rather than lateral epicondylitis. Um, I, think, I think it works, I really do. I, it doesn't work as well as the literature tells me it should work, in my opinion, in my experience, but it, I, they do work. Um, it's sometimes hard to get a good fit. You know, uh, a lot of Americans are obese and those splints, they have these conical forearms. So the splints either are too tight or they slide. And that's been something that that I've had some frustrations with and I long for a better splint. We had all kinds of different manufacturers come in with these uh, counterforce braces and I haven't really found a sweet spot where we say that this is the one, this is the one we ought to use. I would definitely offer it to patients on the buffet table of options and, and uh, have them use it. I, I, tend to, I, tend to use the I tend to use the wrist brace more mm -hmm. for, the simple, for the same reason because the elbow ones tend to slide off so I use yeah. the wrist ones much, and, and they seem to do, if they're going to do anything, they seem to do better, uh, as well as the elbow ones. Well, that's good to know. I, I, I would also recommend the wrist splint more than a, a counterforce yeah. brace, because if, if you have any um, hesitancy or thought that there could be a radial tunnel, the counterforce brace is going to sort of add to the compression on the radial nerve. Oh, yeah. And so, um, and so, and giving them a wrist um, splint will 
it, it'll slow a person down. And it, I mean, it gives you a risk, a, a stiff risk. So now you have to compensate in some other way in order to do um, activities. I mean, the biggest thing that I have patients do is, um, is start lifting in a, in a more supinated position. And what it does is it unloads the extensor um, mechanism uh, for lifting. And so a wrist splint, I think, and I actually have patients wear wrist splints at night, particularly if they're tight at all, because again, you go into wrist, um, elbow, bent, hand positions, you're going to put a stress on the whole um, line. And so I think a wrist splint is a, is a good option. Christine, and a lot of another, Christine, another, avoid... Sorry, another quick one, uh, dry needling. A lot of physiotherapists in India poking a large number of needles into a lot of people. And I can say tennis, that. Elbow, tennis elbow is one of the favorites yeah. to shove in needles. I, Are your I thoughts have, on that? Uh, zero. I have, <laughs> no, I have no experience with that at all. And, um, and so I wouldn't even begin to, to comment. In, in, a different, in a different language, Marco actually uh, referred to that and said they all come back, the Chinese uh, <laughs> reference. But uh, Dr. Varghese, I mean, it's interesting to know if you see any of these RCTs, they always say whatever you inject, there's no difference. I mean, you can inject saline, you can inject steroid, PRP, autologous blood. So what they say is it's, it's not the what you inject, but how you inject in terms of, you know, the peppering technique or, or any of these which sets up an inflammatory process and heals. So, I mean, 10x probably works because of that, where you yeah. don't inject anything, but it's just a percutaneous debridement. So, so uh, can I uh, make a comment? You know, the thing that you talked about, the needling, it was something we used to do in England 30 years ago, um, which are the, it, you know, all the residents were referred the lateral epicondylar pains and all the residents took care of them. And all we did was needling. And it was remarkable uh, that uh, patients either hated you and never came back because of the torture you inflicted on them mm -hmm. or because it actually worked. But there, I mean, so the wheel keeps getting uh, reinvented. And the, I, talking about reinvention of wheels, this concept of putting a splint on is about 100 years old because one of the oldest operations done for lateral epicondylitis was step cut lengthening of the ECRB at the wrist, mind you. So that was done about 100 years ago. But I wanted to ask Marco and Christine what they thought about ultrasound and iontophoresis. Do you see a role for it anywhere? Did you find any literature on it, Marco? Um. Yeah, there is. Uh, I mean, and therapy is shown to be a good staple of treatment for this condition. And um, I, I routinely will refer patients early that I see with this. And whether it's an adjunct to an intervention, which is demonstrably shown to be better, for example, that study on the 10X really reinforced the fact that patients who had 10X and therapy did much better. Hmm. And I think that's a critical take home point. So of course I welcome Christine's thoughts. But I think, I think that, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think the, when you look at it's sort of two components to me, it's the, the acute episode that's going on there that you want to uh, change the path of. And so whatever acute management you would use, um, education, activity modification, um, ice, ultrasound, phonophoresis, steroid injection will, will help that person get over that acute and strengthen the exercises over that acute episode. But I, I think the, the big, the big goal is to stop the recurrence. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the, the strengthening component and, um, activity modification, you know, if they, if they play a sport, then altering the, um, the handle of the tennis racket or the golf club or, you know, whatever they're, they're doing or the activity at work. And so I think the acute management, if you want to use ultrasound or phonophoresis, are, um, are valid um, modalities to use. I don't think you need to go on for six months with that um, type of treatment. I think it's an acute treatment that you try for a period of time. If it works, it, you'll see the results. And if it doesn't, then uh, it doesn't need to be carried on. Do you think it's reasonable to stop after eight or 12 weeks, Christine? Sorry? Eight or 12 weeks is, is uh, yeah, outer yeah, limit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I always say I, I should be able to, um, to um, have the patient say a good, um, uh, 
report about how they're feeling. They may, the pain might not totally be gone, but they don't have constant pain. Uh, their intensity of the pain is less. They can do more with less discomfort. Um, what I say to patients is you didn't get this yesterday. You don't get rid of it tomorrow. And so you're not looking for all your, to do nothing and get rid of your pain um, isn't, um, isn't the goal. The goal is to allow you to do more with less discomfort so that you can build up those muscles and, um, and uh, change your activities and be able to um, get over this episode. But I think within a month or two, you should see um, improvement. Difference, yeah. uh, my question for the, for the entire panel, an elite athlete or a surgeon, a prolific surgeon comes in with symptoms that do not resolve. Would you be a little more uh, uh, biased towards doing earlier surgery in these? Dominant or non-dominant hand? <laughs> how, old is the, how old is the surgeon? <laughs> <laughs> not me. You know, you, know, you know, because there's a very beautiful statement in Reams. The lateral elbow pain is a harmless rite of passage into middle age. <laughs> which means that you ask them to wait, you know, and I want, I was going to ask Marco, have you asked anybody to wait for those eight to 10, 10 months or 12 months or 18 months so that it resolves on its own and anybody's listened to that? Um, you know, I, I say that to every patient. I say that often, uh, my, my quote is that, you know, oftentimes the body just figures this thing out. You know, it just comes to a happy conclusion. Um, now, whether uh, it's six months or 12 months from now, very often it just resolves itself. And um, it could be a three months. And, and I, I uh, encourage them to be patient. I sort of set the stage, if you will. Uh, and then it's up to them. And I, I tend to uh, accommodate their, their, their uh, aggression towards an intervention if, if they have one. I love the idea of uh, the ultrasound guided. I don't personally do the 10X as much because uh, we have a, a group in regenerative medicine here that I just refer them to that does it. But before the 10X, we used to do this, the, the, the needling uh, with uh, whether it would be open with a small incision and just creating a grid on the, um, on the, on the common extensor and just sort of going in at different levels. You know, you go, uh, uh, superficial, medium, deep, superficial, medium, deep. And you just sort of would work along and much like the fenestration we've just talked about. And those worked just about as well as the 10X, I would say. Um, so do you 10X, think that- uh, I'm sorry, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I, so for me, I, I think uh, I tend to partner with them at that point and hopefully uh, many of them get the message. And I think most, many of them do. Um, I don't, I'm not as uh, aggressive in talking about the psychology as uh, David Ring uh, was, you know, or is. I, I don't know, Chai, you, I love your thoughts on that. But, um, you know, David uh, would sort of talk about the psychology, and I'm not smart enough to know about this organ very well. So I can't talk them through the, those things. So I try to talk in simple, more simple minded ways. Um, but if they want surgery, that that experience that Ryan Calfrey described in his uh, Yellow Journal article is very similar to mine. When we ultimately move forward to surgery, which I you know, do thankfully not very often, more often the patients are generally happy. You know, the, the surgery works. It's just a matter of you know, attritionally working uh, on minimizing how much uh, in a surgical intervention we have. So if they're an elite athlete, they want to get back to play. They have to get back to play for their livelihood. Certainly, uh, my threshold for surgery would be much, uh, much lower and much sooner. Uh, there's one more question for Christine. Do you use the power ball in lateral epicondylitis? Um, I, I don't. Um, and, and there's no, I mean, I, I don't have a strong reason why I don't. I mean, I, I've tended to, to, to use just what I've said, patient education, um, stretching exercises, eccentric strengthening exercises, activity modification, and I use a wrist splint. Um, uh, some, some during the day, but certainly at night. And the, during the day is, again, a lot of patient education to just unload it and to recognize the um, types of activities that they do that are probably irritating the inflammatory component of it. I'm sorry, go ahead, Chai. 
I, would, I know Benu. Go ahead. So the thing about a surgeon having lateral epicondylitis? Oh, yes. I had it on both sides at the same time. <laughs> and I was reasonably crabby. I, let's put it this way. Um, but it took me about 20 months. Uh, I had to put in screws on power sometimes. Uh, I had my residents tighten them finally. And microsurgery was a little difficult. But, you know, I just kind of sucked it up and dealt with it. And it went away. Both you sides. you you were going through your passage. I was passaging, yes. <laughs> so it looks like all the interventions we've been talking about, uh, you know, gives us enough time to wait till that interval Marco said six months to one year, and then uh, <laughs> so you need to be you to need to be a that? good yeah you you need to be good at your marketing so that you can hold them on for a year, <laughs> and they're going to be all right. Okay, great. Has anybody uh, treated a tennis player till now? No. <laughs> so, as has been said, you know, you have to keep the. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you for having me participate in this uh, wonderful conference. And I'll be speaking on the role of hand therapy in the management of carpal and cubital tunnel syndromes and lateral epicondylitis. I have no financial disclosures. When patients present with chronic nerve compression, they present with a, a variety of symptoms, uh, beginning perhaps with uh, intermittent paresthesia and numbness, and then progressing to more um, profound sensory and motor losses. And the range in the severity likely represents the continuum of neural changes that occurs um, with chronic nerve compression. And related factors that can impact um, the patient presentation are comorbidities such as diabetes and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and the anatomic location of the nerve. Well, many patients have probably heard about carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, certainly fewer patients have heard about cubital tunnel syndrome. And rest assured that likely every patient that you see has done an internet search to obtain more medical information. And many, many of the websites online are related to patient education, anatomy, and treatment. But it's important to evaluate the source of the information. And a recent study looking at the online uh, resources related to carpal tunnel syndrome found that uh, most of them were written at a higher than the recommended grade six reading level, which may be challenging for some patients to understand the information that's being uh, presented. And then another study looked at YouTube videos and found that 78% had a statement that could reinforce um, carpal tunnel syndrome misconceptions. And so I think as part of the patient education, it's important to direct patients to um, high quality websites. Looking at the scientific uh, literature, there have been a number of systematic reviews that have evaluated hand therapy interventions, exercise, uh, nerve mobility, relatively low level of evidence. Specifically looking at uh, the non-operative interventions, um, the highest the randomized control trials have really been done looking at splinting and steroid injections, and then lower quality studies looking at exercise, um, nerve mobility, and other interventions. But the limitations of the conclusions from these studies aren't just in the study design, is that in most of these studies, the outcomes assess short-term relief of symptoms and didn't really look at long-term relief relief of symptoms or recurrence. So my perspective on uh, therapy management is patient education so that the patient better understands uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, what's happening uh, with chronic nerve compression, the um, symptoms that um, uh, occur with compression of the median nerve, and then um, identifying and modifying activities that can exacerbate symptoms. Uh, we recommend splinting at night in a risk-neutral position, and um, most um, patients uh, tolerate this uh, very well, wearing a, a wrist splint at night. And then um, education, exercise, um, and nerve mobilization, particularly in those patients with multi-level nerve compression. And I think it's important to assess um, the entire upper extremity uh, to identify proximal sites of compression that can be 
adding to patients' um, symptoms. And I think in general, successful uh, therapy management is seen with those patients with mild and moderate nerve compression and uh, not as likely in patients who have severe uh, chronic nerve compression. Postoperatively, um, after surgery, patients have a minimal immobilization, maybe a lighter bulky dressing that's removed uh, one or two days after surgery. They start on early range of motion for the fingers, wrists, and arms. We recommend a use of a night splint um, in a wrist neutral position for a couple of weeks until they get full range of motion. And it's not so much to protect the surgical site, but more to uh, for patient comfort so that they have um, a better night's sleep and wake up with less discomfort in the morning. And then after a, a month or so, begin strengthening exercises in six to eight weeks, uh, full activity without restrictions. And most patients have complete resolution of symptoms. Compression of the ulnar nerve at the cubital tunnel, it's important to recognize that there are multiple sites that contribute to the compression, but it's not just direct compression, it's also the tension and traction on the ulnar nerve um, with elbow flexion that contributes to the nerve compression. And then in those patients who have uh, ulnar nerve subluxation, uh, the nerve is positioned in a more superficial position and more vulnerable to trauma and compression. So again, my perspective, uh, a lot of patient education um, to have patients avoid um, activities and uh, that uh, increase elbow flexion and put direct pressure on the nerve um, and have patients wear an elbow pad. Um, initially, I'd have patients wear it all the time to um, highlight and help them identify positions during the day that they're putting pressure on the nerve. Um, in my experience, patients don't uh, tolerate uh, splints at night that uh, they find those uncomfortable and are generally non-compliant. So an elbow pad to protect the nerve and education to go into more arm extended uh, positions and then exercise uh, nerve mobilization, particularly um, with patients who have multi-level nerve compression. And it's important to, in particularly in ulnar nerve, to assess for proximal sites of compression. In terms of uh, surgical uh, procedures, there are a number uh, that are performed from decompression to medial epicondylectomy and various anterior transpositions. In general, they all advocate for Im minimal immobilization after surgery and uh, early range of motion. In terms of post-operative management, it depends on the um, operative procedure, um, but again, I'll recommend early range of motion, bulky dressings removed uh, two to three days after surgery, and uh, while they're in the bulky dressing, you can start on range of motion in the uh, hand and arm, and then begin um, at the elbow, and even with an anterior transposition, uh, submuscular, transmuscular, you can begin elbow extension in a forearm pronated position, and then as they become more comfortable with elbow extension, then incorporate uh, forearm supination. We recommend uh, use of a night splint, a sling, sorry, a use of a night sling until uh, the patient's comfortable with full extension. Again, it's so that the person gets a better night's sleep and um, doesn't irritate their arm uh, by going into positions uh, that would exacerbate symptoms of pain at the elbow um, and operative site. And then uh, two to four weeks after surgery, you'd expect that the individual would have full range of motion and begin strengthening exercises. And then um, within a couple of months after surgery, full activity without restrictions. Uh, lateral epicondylitis uh, involves uh, the wrist extensor origin and typically related to repetitive wrist motion and grip activities with alternating forearm uh, rotation. Patients complain of um, uh, pain to the lateral aspect of the elbow and often radiate into the forearm. And I would say that most patients resolve with non-operative treatment. Um, but I think the goal in, in the non-operative treatment is really uh, preventing recurrence. And, um, and so that would um, uh, come with the activity and, um, and future 
activity modification. So in the acute inflammatory phase, um, rest and uh, use of ice, um, it's important to identify activities that exacerbate pain and to minimize uh, those activities. And then lifting in a forearm supinated position. If lifting in a, in a forearm pronated position, um, the extensors will assist in that lifting process in gripping. And so um, encourage patients to lift in a forearm supinated position. Uh, wrist extension, uh, strengthening exercises are done eccentrically. I often recommend night splint um, uh, with a, it at the wrist. And again, it's so that patients don't end up in uh, wrist flexed, uh, finger flexed, and putting stress on uh, perhaps a tight um, extensor mechanism. And uh, have a caution with counter force braces. Um, because pressure on uh, in that area may put uh, increased pressure on the radial nerve in the radial tunnel. So in conclusion, it's important to identify and modify activities that increase symptoms, assess the entire upper extremity, other sites of uh, nerve compression, musculoskeletal conditions that can be contributing to symptoms post-operatively, early mo mo motion, enhance neuromobility, neural mobility, minimize scarring, and regain range of motion and strength and function. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, right. for that. Uh, right. uh, Christine, I, th I think, I think uh, there are no specific questions for you. And, I, I think I've learned most and, of the no, questions. And, 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 and I think, no, and I think I know why. It's because we don't know what you do in your department, but we love to send them there because they don't come back to us. So whatever you're doing seems to be seems to be perfectly right. Um, Very good. <laughs> yes, can, uh, I, can I ask a question, Christy? What's the basic principle of nerve gliding exercises? Can you give us a guideline of how to do these nerve gliding exercises in various uh, situations like carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel. What what is the basic I think, principle? Well, I mean I, I, I think the, the basic premise is is that um, with compression the nerve can get um, adhered to um, to certain particular areas. And if you think of the nerve as a as a total line from um, uh, cervical to hand, then every time the uh, a branch comes off and innervates a nerve, it's tethered down. So depending on where you have um, lack of mobility, it'll, it'll pull on that nerve. And so I think the idea is to um, increase the, the length of the line to allow you to um, move without discomfort. And then also, like I said before, is um, nerve is made up of connective tissue and neural tissue. And so even within the nerve, whether it goes through a joint, it's going to have, or around a joint at the cubital tunnel, it's going to have more, more scarring. So I think um, that's the idea of um, segmental. I think of it as segmental mobilization and uh, complex mobilization to me is the nerve that, that, um, goes over numerous joints and um, you need to stretch it out. Having said that, I don't think that there's a tissue that is more intolerant of being overstretched that isn't going to exacerbate symptoms. So I see uh, lots of patients who would say, I had therapy, it made me much worse. And I think that if a patient is much worse with neuromobilization or stretching exercises, it's they're, they're, they're doing too much too fast. And so I think of it as more segmental um, mobilization and then combine it. So if it's a patient with um, carpal tunnel and you think the extremity is in, the entire extremity is involved, then start distally with those mobilizations, move to the forearm. And then in the meantime, do more proximal exercises. If it's um, um, musculoskeletal or if it's nerve, Proximally, then do those as um, segmental, and then combine it to um, an entire uh, mobilization. So eventually, you want the patient to be able to fully move the arm through range of motion and not have any um, increase of symptoms. Can I? Most operatively, just... uh, Christine, when do you start nerve mobilization exercises? Most operatively. Um, well, I think every exercise that you think of as range of motion for joint is doing nerve mobilization. 
And so um, even the patient who um, we were at the beginning, um, somebody said that they immobilized the uh, wrist. It might've been actually you immobilized yeah, the wrist for a week to 10 days. Um, and that's fine because movement of the hand, movement of the fingers, movement of the elbow, movement of the arm is going to do some neuromobilization um, in that, that area, even though the, the wrist is immobilized. And so, um, so I think that it, what you think of as, or, um, is a joint range of motion for muscle or joint, it will have an effect on the nerve. Um, in our practice, I mean, um, uh, uh, dressing, uh, minimal dressing, bulky dressings taken off two to three days after surgery, and the patient starts on wrist um, range of motion. So the um, nerve mobilization can start within a day or two after surgery. And the only reason not to start it up the day of surgery is because probably there's a light dressing on there. Okay. Ashwat, you have a question. Yeah, I want to know how frequently you use the uh, muscle stimulation or a nerve stimulation in your practice? And what is the recommendation? So for, yeah, um, not, not often. Um, so for nerve compression, probably never. Um, in, um, and you could use it, I mean, you, you might use, um, so nerve stimulation to me is different than muscle stimulation. And so they, um, there's a lot of talk about using intraop or um, perioperative nerve stimulation to, um, and I think that there's probably a lot of validity for that to increase the um, axonal regeneration. The muscle stim, I don't use it a lot. And part of it is because a big part of my practice is teaching patient exercises and to um, not incorporate um, uh, modalities that require patients to um, to come in unless it's absolutely necessary. For nerve injury, I'm often asked about um, uh, muscle stim and you have to differentiate denervated from innervated muscle. And so with a denervated muscle, there are no studies, um, clinical studies to show that using um, uh, direct galvanic stimulation um, increases the timeline for re -innervation. And so um, I don't, I don't think that in, so again, in my practice, I don't think that there's any reason to um, increase, to uh, stimulate denervated muscle if you can increase the timeline. For re muscle, you need a lot of re muscle to pick it up with alternating current. And so um, I think that um, once it's re if you incorporate that as a patient education component, because um, a lot of these, um, whether it's nerve injury or nerve compression, it's a lot of alteration of the movement pattern and it's a lot of changes cortically. So whether, so with the sensory motor cortex changes then using muscle stimulation in addition to exercise to um, re-establish a new or um, uh, an existing motor pattern, then I think it's useful. Thank you, uh, Christy. Uh, we'll go to the case discussion. Uh, Ashwat, can you share your screen, please? So we, we, we have three cases, uh, actually four, but then uh, there are four prepared, but based on the time, we'll see how it goes. Uh, these are what we have not covered till now uh, in the lectures. So the first case, uh, Ashwat. Uh, is this visible? Yes. I put it for the full screen mode. Okay, so uh, here is a 66-year-old lady who presented to us with the, she had a history of diabetes and uh, bronchial asthma. And uh, she had undergone a trigger finger release uh, elsewhere. This was about uh, four months uh, uh, earlier. Now she presented with restriction of uh, ring finger movement. There's a lot of scar tenderness. Uh, this is particularly involving the ring finger and there is altered sensation. She's got some tingling, paresthesia, and there is restricted movement. So my question to the uh, panelists, uh, so what do you think uh, uh, which comes to your mind when you come across some patients like uh, you know, we have operated on a patient and uh, they have come back with uh, tingling, paresthesia, and scar tenderness. And how do you proceed with respect to investigation and uh, confirmation of the diagnosis? 
So, uh, any thoughts? Pankaj, you would like to take that? He may have been missing. Uh, but, uh, no, 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 he's there. He's there. I'm, I'm listening, but I, I may have missed uh, uh, Ashwat's uh, description of the case, so I will refrain. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Ashwat, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, does she have intact sensation? Did I miss that? Distally is a sensation intact in the digit? Yeah, it is decreased. Uh, she has got paresthesia, tingling. It's very painful. Yes, it is. Uh, there is numbness in the ring finger as well as the little finger. Okay, so the contiguous uh, surfaces are tingly and numb. Yes. Does she have any more triggering or does she have smooth motion? No, it's painful. Particularly uh -huh. the MP joint movements are... Triggering, uh, not as such, but uh, it's very difficult to elicit. It's uh, very painful. That is the complaint she came to us with. Mm -hmm. Ashraf, can I ask, uh, did, did she have numbness immediately after the surgery or did it progress later after surgery? Or is it hard to, no, hard she to came, say? Uh, so she had uh, uh, triggering. She... Uh, Clearly told that after the surgery, she started getting tingling and paresthesia. So that is the uh, point uh, when we the asked incision, her. The incision seems to be a little eccentric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that would raise the doubts of having had a nerve injury at the time of surgery. My best way forward would be to do an ultrasound and look at the nerves, look at the completeness because just because the incision is not placed correctly i'd also look at the completeness of the procedure that was initially planned and then plan how i'd go ahead and there be some infection also with all this stiffness and pain but the skin yeah. and the skin and the, there's no swelling there's no there, there's no inflammatory changes near the incision i would put that as my probably a second second uh, option yeah. Diagnosis, yes. But yes, I would keep that open, yes. Does the x-ray show anything? No, x-ray doesn't show anything. Uh, uh, x-ray is normal. We did actually an ultrasound. An ultrasound, uh, uh, I'll just show you, share the ultrasound finding. So the A1 fully was found to be released. The surgeon had released it. And uh, the scar tissue with synovial thickening, that is uh, what they observed. And the dynamic ultrasound showed no triggering. And what they observed was the digital nerve was edematous, bulky, and entrapped. And it was not to be in discontinuity. So, and there is peritoneous fluid and tendinopathy of the long flexors of the ring finger. Now, with that uh, picture, uh, if I have to go back, and uh, I would like to ask whether is there a role for conservative uh, management and uh, if so, for how long? When do you decide yeah. that? Uh... Ashwat, here's, here's an important point. This coming out from Manipal, where we know the ultrasound is absolutely fantastic, I would say the nerve is intact. Conservative treatment for me would be my first line. But if it was anywhere else, I might be tempted to look once. No, if, if you look at the ultrasound report, go back to the ultrasound report. It's a D matters. Bulky, entrapped. But the post-surgical ultrasound, I am certain the sonologist doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> they haven't looked at it like we have. So I would give him the benefit of the doubt if the nerve was intact. Okay, but they also said doesn't appear to be in discontinuity, so... Absolutely, most important. And it's coming from Manipal. Like I said, always see who's done the ultrasound. Do you trust that person? And if yes, go with him. I, I wish so, I were as trusting as Sudhir. I trust... No, I do. I, I, Chaitanya, I come from a place where I myself have sat in for 500 I know, but I trust my eyes with yes. 3.5 loop magnification. My, 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 sonologist, my sonologist can tell me what I don't see during surgery. <laughs> I would so vigorous it. retraction of the nerve with some uh, infection. Yeah. Binu sticking with infection. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> saying everything is there's a lot of fluid so this i know we'll take in you know um, i would i would also question another thing you know the a0 pulley described by doyle and blight i worry about that in diabetics because that can be thickened and uh, it can act as a source of entrapment for the digital nerve also i'm also concerned about partial injury so mm-hmm. you don't lose anything by opening it and looking again and how do you know it's not a neuromyelin continuity it will look like a bulky swollen nerve on ultrasound you can tell the two apart you can i with don't a, know with a, with a good machine yes the ones that we have in our operating rooms they're not so good but the ones that they have with the sonologist oh you if you look at the images they're really good but then you need to have such training that you want to know what the surgeon wants to understand and it's a decision between operating and not operating and that's a very very difficult decision so you need to have a sonologist with whom you sat through a lot of number of these cases and only then can you make your decision because you've already gone back and forth on this in the cases in the past so it's it's a very very steep learning curve so if you didn't have the advantage of having sat with someone like this i would open it like myself i, I would, would open be, it i would, I would open it to explore it yes absolutely absolutely but getting the patient to come back to you for opening it in india is a little difficult sure uh, i mean culturally i understand that ashut how many days after the original surgery was this four months four months for months okay okay so uh, if it had come a little earlier i think is there any role for therapy or would we like to wait and observe or should we put them uh, what what is the panel says i i i would have said um it, when i looked at the role of therapy i would have said like a month or two you might consider therapy at four months um out um i mean you could try it I mean, just to see if they got better range of motion if it was related to um stiffness of the hand but my worry would be that it's a little nick in the nerve um that's uh contributing to these symptoms good 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 point christine it's a nick in the nerve <laughs> now i want the surgeons to tell me what they're going to do when they go in for a nick in the nerve so yeah, your your yeah. trust in manipal ultrasound remains intact <laughs> the nerve <laughs> remains intact no, but then now now you got a nick in the nerve now tell me what you're going to do <laughs> it doesn't look like a neuroma it's a nick in the nerve and most of these with neurotaxis you expect them to heal by themselves so i don't know what i would do yeah ashwin so, go ahead tell us the yeah, information so that's what we observed we found a neuroma in continuity with the common it involved uh, both the, the common digital nerve to on the contiguous side of the ring and the little finger and the a1 pulley was intact and there was a lot of extensive additions involving the so something like a, a type 2 crps uh, like which was there so we were thinking what to do so, uh, this is what we did uh, we did a sural nerve grafting and uh, this patient uh, subsequently we put them on a therapy program and uh, she had good pain relief and uh, uh, when we saw her in the last follow up could you have utilized the posterior intraosseous nerve instead of sural nerve yeah that is uh, an option uh, but i have uh, used uh, posterior intraosseous earlier you, actually you need it's quite a long incision you may have to give on the dorsal side of the hand and uh, at the wrist you, you could have numerous sources for the graft yeah but i mean obviously she she felt better after your intervention so that's a good thing any anything different you would have done no, any other like, happen- how big was the gap it was around size, the the neuroma meters i would say it was around 3 cm after 3 cm wow that that's a long distance which didn't show up on the ultrasound questions uh, our reliance on the ultrasound yeah 
So I think it's it's a quality of the nerve also once explored and you know debrided in the whole area what happened. I think that's what uh, I think Ashwat took that uh, three centimeters graft and also to keep it a little more lax for early mobilization. I think that's yeah. what he did. Yeah. Do you have access to nerve allografts in in India? No, we don't have access to allografts. No. no. Okay. Would you, would you, Marco, would you, would you use one of the conduits? Well, I think three centimeters is a little on the high end for a conduit uh, to me. You know, I try to keep it less than two centimeters for uh, the nerve tubes. Um, but, you know, it looked like you might could get by with a nerve tube. Uh, how old is the patient again, Ashwath? How old was the patient? Oh, she's a 66 year old. 66. Oh. Yeah, you know, I, I think it might be a, for three centimeters, I would probably say no. Yeah, I, um, I'd be tempted to consider a nerve graft. Uh, you know, we've, we've gone back and forth with the PIN to speak to your point, try, you know, and, and, you know, it's, a, it's, it looks like a, a big nerve, um, but a lot of it is epinurium, you know, and yeah. there's only, you know, a few fascicles in there. Yeah. So, um, but Certainly, it's uh, it's not it's it'd be easy to harvest, and it would be a, a reasonable option as well as some of the others that have been discussed. Yeah, but the the ratio of sural nerve fascicle to connective tissue is much yeah. more favorable for sural, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone would consider uh, burying it more, taking it more proximally, and burying it uh, under the muscle or uh, uh, bone. No, in a sixty-six why? in a sixty-six year old, yeah. you're tempting me. But no, I would still go in for the graft. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm not a surgeon. Uh, let's. Uh, that's my disclosure. But would you, because it's a non-critical um, side of the ring finger, would you, would you ever, would you consider doing an end to side nerve transfer, mm -hmm. sensory from the digital to the uh, small finger? Yeah, but the, this was involving uh, the little finger also. So what oh. we observed uh, was uh, that the uh, uh, the radial side of the little finger was also involved. So two of the digital nerves. Were, so that uh, made us think uh, that uh, graft would be a better option. But otherwise, yes, if it was involving the ring finger alone, I think uh, yes, that is one of the options which came to our mind. Which, 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 which didn't come to many of the surgeons on this group. Christine, you should have been a surgeon. <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should go ahead with the next case. Mithun, uh, yeah. Anil, I'm getting this from you because I looked at the time. Yeah, yeah. I should go for the next case. Yeah. Mithun, Mithun is, is presenting? Yeah. No, I think I, shall I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I go back. No, no, to the next case. So Bithun is presenting. Is there? He's there. He's there. Okay. Shall I present from here itself? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can. Okay. Okay. You can. Uh, this is a 40, uh, 42 year old lady homemaker who is a diabetic and hypertensive. Uh, she was operated six months back elsewhere for uh, dorsal ganglion excision. And she presented to us with uh, this scar and restricted movement of the left thumb and wrist with severe tenderness and paresthesia over the hand. Uh, so she presented to us six months after surgery and uh, it was uh, with the longitudinal scar over the dorsum at the base of the thumb. And she, she had severe scar tenderness and paresthesia with the restricted movement of the thumb and the wrist. So uh, how to go about this case? So what would be the possible diagnosis? Sir? Binu, would you take that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, definitely looks like there's some uh, injury to the nerve here because of the paresthesias and all that. And uh, you said the thumb is also not moving well. Now, the question is, uh, again, is, a, is, is he able to extend the thumb? The yes, EPL, is EPL working. was intact, sir. EPL is working. It's intact. intact. Can you just insert the photo, photo back previous slide? EPL is working. Okay. So um, I would go for a 
in this situation uh, go for an ultrasound and see if the any of the uh, superficial radial nerve or its branches are sir uh, any comment on the incisions uh, the longitudinal incision at this place yeah we don't do longitudinal incisions normally no at this point this point to remove a ganglion we generally don't do either a transverse incision or even a zigzag incision is my preferred uh, approach the other the other point the other point that i'd like to bring out here is the fact that this patient has a keloidal tendency and that means the same tendency exists in the tissues underneath so there's a lot of fibrosis there <clears throat> So you need a good sonologist to tell you whether the nerve is actually damaged or is just stuck in the fibrosis because the EPL is functioning. So there was some restriction of the wrist movements also. So is it the second compartment is also involved? It's is probably, there a weakness sorry, it's of the wrist? I mean, the capsule, because it's a ganglion excision, they would have gone up to the capsule. It sounds it like not? tension neurodesis. Uh, yeah. It sounds like a tension neurodesis from a neuroma affecting the radial sensory nerve, which is why every time she moves, it hurts. That's yeah. why she's not moving her wrist. Okay. Uh, we went ahead with the ultrasound. Uh, I would like to put the ultrasound picture. So uh, the ultrasound says uh, tendon integrity uh, was there. However, some features of decoherent tenosynovitis was present. Neuroma was observed, but they were not able to trace the nerve distally. So only proximally, they were able to trace the superficial radial nerve with the discontinuity and a neuroma. So this was the ultrasound report. Then then that radiograph uh, was uh, normal and other routine investigations were done, which was within normal limits. So how there's, to go have it with this case? There's, there's a Quick question here, which says the role of Tinel sign in this case to diagnose a neuroma or a neuroma in continuity. Maybe this one or the earlier one, it's four minutes, three minutes ago. So maybe one of this case or the earlier case, but would you depend upon a Tinel sign or an ultrasound? Or both. Or both. Yeah. I mean, if you have a Tinel sign, which is uh which is annoyingly and unpleasantly painful. At four I mean, all, of us have a, all of us will have a tinel sign if you hit the ulnar nerve hard enough behind your medial epicondyle. But the key with this tinel sign is that, as uh, Jules Tinel called it, Fur Miyama, it's the feeling of unpleasantness that the patient will say, This is exactly how I feel when I touch it at home. That is a hallmark of a neuroma, whether in continuity or not. And if that were the case to me, uh, I would have said, yeah, that's something I would want to explore and address. I don't know about the decurvin stenosynovitis, but that may be just an incidental finding in a post-operative setting, but I'm not sold on that. Uh, but yeah. yes, otherwise, definitely, you'll have to explore, and uh, that's what I would also do. Yeah. So uh, if you explore and you find a neuroma, what are your options? Pankaj Pan wants to say something, I think. Yeah, Pankaj. Yeah, just before he goes for the operative options, hmm. uh, what one of the important things with uh, everybody talking sonography and uh, me and Dr. Warrior do share a common sonologist. And one of the things which I find very useful is, is I, I ask for the location of probe tenderness, and it and it's pretty accurate whether it is the uh, radial half of the pulley or the ulnar half of the pulley or. It's, it's that accurate. So a probe tenderness is a very useful sign when we are dealing with uh, uh, sonography to diagnose these conditions. It's also very interesting. You won't lose anything. You won't burn any bridges. If you were to find the radial sensory nerve about 8 to 10 cm proximal to the tip of the styloid and instill some lidocaine and examine the patient again and see if the symptoms completely resolve. And if they do, you have a diagnostic uh, exam right there. So. Uh, uh, Ashwath, I, uh, sorry, Mithun, I think you said uh, the distal part of the nerve was not traceable. Yes, sir. Not at all, meaning anywhere? Uh, anywhere along the course of the nerve, normal course of the nerve. Then what Chaitanya says has a big impact on what we would do later. Yes. 
it uh, i'm i'm guessing the location of the incision suggests that the nerve is already in an advanced stage of arborization and and not a monoblock if you want to call it that i think it's arborized looking at the placement of the incision so uh, marco what would be your preferred way of dealing with the neuroma yeah i would share uh, Ty's concerns uh, you know i i would be um I would be tempted to consider finding, uh, if the nerve is in discontinuity surgically, to find a place to bury the nerve where it would just be maybe not likely to be a source of pain. And we've gone to actually burying the nerves in the muscle, um, finding a, uh, either in the first dorsal compartment area or in intermetacarpal spaces and just sort of settling it in there. And there's been some science that suggests that the nerve will arborize in there and be less likely to form an aroma. It's, it's weak science, but it is science. And I would fear that it would be difficult to, um, to do a nerve reconstruction given the location of the, uh, of the scar. The other Wait. issue is what, how do you prevent a scar from reforming? Right. And, <laughs> quick, 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 quick story about my residency. We did a deco veins and we destroyed the nerve. When I went back, I was a houseman then, I went back as a registrar and the same patient comes in the OPD and my boss tells me, you remember this girl? And I said, yes. And she was in tremendous pain. So we recessed the nerve and put it into the brachioradialis. And I finished my surgical training and I was there as a post MS registrar and she came back to the outpatients and my boss tells me, do you remember this woman who is now a mother of two? And I said, yes, I do. So we buried it into the nerve and I have no knowledge whether that helped her or not. So the question is, where do you bury it? Go ahead with the slides. Mithun? Yes, sir. On exploration, we found there was a neuroma, and as ultrasound suggested, there was discontinuity. So, uh, this was the intra op picture after exploration. So, there is a neuroma with a discontinuity. So, we went ahead with scar, uh, burying the neuroma into the bone. That's called repositioning into the radius. So, this is what we did. So uh, I would like to ask uh, which of these options uh, would lead to least recurrence of the options available, like burying into the muscle or burying into the bone, which has got the least recurrence? Sudhir, sir? I certainly don't know. I'm the wrong one. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. Uh, there's no science to say. Uh, my preference has been to going into muscle um, but I can't prove that that's better than going into bone. I think going into muscle is a good idea, but it should be a large segment. And I mm -hmm. think what uh, Susan McKinnon recommends is a, is a good thought, where you bury the end of it in the muscle, but you leave a segment in the muscle. And both of them, so you, you crush the nerve proximal to the end that you buried, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. you know the neuroma that forms ultimately will form in the muscle belly and not at the tip. So it's, it's well padded. So you create a two level uh, situation, so to speak. And, I, and that's, that's my preferred thing. I, I, I obviously cannot, I don't have enough volume to tell you which one is better, but. So my next question would be if the distal nerve was intact and it was a neuroma in continuity, how would be the treatment option? What would be the treatment option? It would like be still the same or we'll do a grafting. No, just what you did with Ashwat's case. You would put a graft. That's the best way to allow things to, to progress physiologically and prevent the, uh, the, the exposure of what is unknown to us or which is less known to us. And we, we, I think uh, I would graft this one. Even in this case, sir, where a superficial radial nerve is involved, in that Definitely. case, we need to begin. I, I, oh, we've done that in, uh, on a number of occasions and we've had a uh, complete resolution of the discomfort may not be all the problems, but definitely the acute discomfort, it goes down considerably. Uh, if the legs are question. identifiable, that would definitely be the way to yes. go. Chaitanya, what would be the reason if there's a recurrence and it's buried into the bone? 
So the my my thoughts about betting and bone are perhaps a little biased because I see one thing nerves don't like is being tethered. And burial into bone is one surefire way of tethering a nerve. It's a gliding structure. It's a, it's it's got it's elastic. It's got connective tissue, and you're doing something really finite and stopping it from doing all of the above. So, you know, at the point where it turns into the bone, to me, is is a is a problem. I stopped doing that a long time ago. I, anytime I would bury it in muscle. But going back to the principle of neurotropism, if you give the nerve a target to grow into with a graft and you reset back to healthy fascicles, even if it doesn't give you sensation back, it won't form a neuroma. Yeah. You know, that's a win-win as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Marco, well, do you have any experience with uh, the silicone capping and such things? We have, you know, that hasn't been successful either, but I, I'll echo, I, it hasn't been predictably successful, but let me say this, uh, you know, Bill Cooney taught me that years ago uh, and I've abandoned it. It doesn't work as well in my experience. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with the tethering concept because I worry about the tether. And I also worry about, you know, bone overgrowth onto the nerve, making the nerve raw, making it irritated, uh, compressing the nerve, squeezing it. Uh, again, I, none of this is hard science, but it just seems to be, uh, uh, and again, anecdotally, when I've buried it in muscle, it seems to be less problematic uh, for, for many patients. Injections, injections of alcohol, phenol, or anything else, We've done that for neuromata in the fingertips of amputation stumps. Some, again, not good science, not enough to talk about, but some of them do, do, do tell us that they're much, much better off. My practice is actually to put it in bone, but recently one of my colleagues uh, went to Susan McKinnon and uh, I think he came back and said, there is a chance that you can get a Intraosseous neuroma, which can be quite painful. I, I have no experience with that, but that is a thought. You know, then you need to excise the bone. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> I, I've never had that. I've never had that situation happen because I've buried quite a few patients' neuromas in the bone without much of a problem. So, but you know, here's the thing: I would ask you, the bone that you bury it into also matters. If the mm -hmm. bone has so much torsional mobility like a radius, it's different from burying it in a metacarpal or in the ulna. Okay. It's really very different because depending on the torsional mobility of the bone, that's how much the nerve will have to excurse, right? But Chai, just, just a thought. Hmm. What if you release the nerve all along mm -hmm. and bury it with enough leeway? Give sure. it enough sure. leeway. Would Absolutely. That, would that counter what you're saying? That would obviously counter what I'm saying, but the, then exactly. So you would then have to free up the nerve a long ways, make it really slack, and then uh, how much will that affect you? But I don't know. I think that may be what Binu does. So, uh, just to bring, sir, can I interrupt a minute? So just to bring in, how about central central suturing of the digital nerves in case of ray amputation? How good is it? Would you elaborate on that? Because I, I missed uh, out. Uh, no, sir. We see a radial and ulna digital now. We suture it to each radial. other yeah. and make a cut distally so that it acts as a neural tube so that no neuroma forms and then suture it back. I, I don't have any experience of that. But if I have a ray resection and I have two ends of nerves, there's nothing wrong with suturing one to the other. It's like doing a neural paneva halevich, basically, you know. I've done that numerous times, uh, and I, I agree. I, it's so uh, it's worked pretty well. Ray amputations or amputations approximately, if you got nerve ends, you just it doesn't seem to be as problematic as leaving the nerves. You know. Um, Ashwin, can, we have, can we have the next case? Last case. Ten minutes, guys. Yeah. Okay, I'll present this. Uh, this is a 54-year-old lady, uh, diabetic uh, maker, who had uh, pain and tingling in uh, hands since uh, 10 years, weakness and loss of sensation uh, of the index and middle finger since three months, 
uh, that's what she told and uh, there is a ulcer uh, it's been there since one month it's not acting and she actually came uh, seeking treatment for the ulcer uh, uh, that was the main complaint initially so uh, the same questions uh, that i would ask so uh, what are the possible diagnosis uh, that comes to our mind uh, when you have a picture like this and how do we proceed so uh, this is the function uh, that we actually uh, we were examining can i put my little like a timer yeah 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 now there is hardly any abduction uh, present in this finger in the thumb so how do we proceed uh, How long has she had the ulcer, Rashma? Has it been a long time? No, it's there since one month. That's what uh, the lady told us. Does it seem to be healing or is it more chronic? Yeah, it's in the partially healing stage. She was yeah. handling some hot objects while cooking uh, at her home. And uh, since then, she's been uh, having this. In addition, I, to carp in addition to carpal tunnel, I, you know, concern it would raise concerns about the vascularity and her, her perfusion we know yeah so your thoughts what looks like a severe carpal tunnel but of course she has all the other uh, reasons can it be a, whether it's an ischemic ulcer also is a question we have to rule out and uh, then whether she has a diabetic neuropathy Mm -hmm. Meaning, uh, such a I mean, lady of this age having so, we have to anyway investigate her with uh, vascular studies and nerve uh, nerve conduction velocities. Then uh, see where you're going to put it. Whether it's a ischemic uh, ulcer or is it a trophic ulcer mm -hmm. due to the nerve problem, and whether she has diabetic neuropathy or it's a Carpal tunnel, uh, severe carpal tunnel uh, compression. And first thing to do is to get the ulcer healed, and then go go and uh, if it is a carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, we can do the carpal tunnel release uh, once that is healed. If otherwise, the it goes to the vascular guys to see what can be done. You know, you saw that ab, uh, almost absolutely. I, I, I saw that. I saw yeah. that. Now, that's what uh, we had a discussion. Dr. Tate said, no, he doesn't do it primarily, the uh, opponent's plasty. But I do. So, we, if you're planning for a carpal tunnel release after this and the diagnosis is mediated nerve, then you, uh, I, I don't mind going ahead with the opponent's plasty also. Marco, is it... Uh... Same for you, primary uh, commits with the release, or would you wait? I think for this case, I would consider it. I, I usually don't. I usually wait, much like the first presentation. And, and uh, um, But the commits is a pretty straightforward. You could do it through the same incision. And uh, it would. I think her prognosis for recovery is, a little, depending on what the findings are from the electrodiagnostic studies, um, I, I'm assuming she's got probably peripheral neuropathy that's pretty profound, so I'd be tempted to, that's gonna undermine the success of her surgery or recovery. So I'd be tempted to, uh, uh, in this case, do the, uh, the, um, the opponent's plastic. What is sir? I, I tend to favor the camets. Mm -hmm. I even have an occasion where there is no palmaris. I've gone ahead and then done a, an in, uh, extensor indices transfer because uh, at that age, with that kind of wasting that you can see causing puckering of the skin there, I, I think it's going to take a very long time. They're much happier if you get them back into function earlier. And I think the trophic ulcer is a pointer of the severity of sensory loss. You know, exactly. Yes. So mm -hmm. it's probably not going to recover, even if I'm you do a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we know it's not vasculopathic? 
Yeah. I would say this. I would argue that this is diabetic uh, in a peripheral yeah, vascular right. ulcer. Ashwath is smiling. Ashwath is smiling. Is, Ash, so Ashwath he has, has to tell he has us. an ace up his sleeve now. <laughs> Ashwath has to tell us whether it is uh, vasculopathic or neuropathic. So we did the uh, Doppler and also the uh, this one. And it turned out to be uh, severe uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, she ha is, is, she's a diabetic, but yes, uh, it's under control. She's on regular treatment. And uh, uh, this is actually what we did. It's the same uh, what uh, we've been talking uh, about, primary reconstruction of opponent's plasty. So we took the palmaris longus with palmar fascia and did the gametes uh, opponent's plasty. And yes, it was uh, se severely compressed. Uh, and uh, this is the ulcer status in three weeks' time. So we immobilized, we did a tendon transfer, we sent her with the plaster uh, cast. When she came back uh, for therapy in three to four weeks' time, uh, the ulcer had healed uh, by that time. I put her on uh, uh, therapy. So this is a uh, preliminary inability to abduct. There's a lot of weakness. Uh... Excellent. Excellent. This is uh, later uh, when she came for follow-up. Very nice. So if you had to assess her vascularity, how would you do that? Let's say it was not a trophic ulcer. Let's say it was ischemic. What would you do? Uh, uh, if it was ischemic, I think uh, uh, we, we would have done a Doppler study to see uh, whether any uh, blockage is there, any vascular. No, Chaitanya is asking of small vessel disease and vascular. Like right? yeah. yeah, and more of autoimmune kind of histories and uh, background. Would you entertain the role of uh, calcium channel blockers and a blood thinner as well as a digital sympathectomy in your management? Yes, that is one of the options, but we don't have uh, that much uh, experience uh, of coming across uh, uh, this kind of... We have seen this uh, in scleroderma where uh, we often come across this kind of uh, uh, problem. But uh, yes, usually it's managed by our uh, medical team. So we generally refer it to uh, our uh, rheumatology and uh, physician team. They where they put them. Yes, on uh, uh, medical management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Chaitanya, thanks. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for the opportunity for uh, for this moderation thing. Uh, over to you to for the yeah. final. So, uh, first of all, thanks to all our attendees who, who probably hung out here to uh, have fun with us. It's been a blast for the last two, two or three hours. I should thank all of you for staying, staying with us. To our sponsors, the Wies Foundation, the Deshpande Foundation, Venus Health, in, uh, the Indian Society of Surgery of the Hand. Thank you so much. Ortho TV, you made this work. So, thank you. To our faculty, Anil, Pankaj, Sudhir, Binu, Ashwat, Mithun, and, not, uh, and of course, Marco, and last but not least, Christine from Canada. Thank you so much for helping make this such a success today. Next week, uh, we'll be back for session number three, and Binu is going to be spearheading the attack with uh, tendon injuries and combined injuries. And we'll have faculty from the United States, Canada, as well as India for that session as well. So we look forward to that. Thank you, everyone. This was fun. Let's do it again next Saturday. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good night. Honor to be so much. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Neeraj, I, will, I need some pointers from you before <laughs> you go how to do this. I'll call you. Yeah, yeah. Neeraj, we are still alive. Neeraj. Neeraj, I I will have to call him. I'm calling Neeraj. Don't worry. Chooses like well, it, they'll disc, they'll hopefully stop the they'll uh, change the recording accordingly. I'm here. Yeah, we are not live, right? <laughs>